everyone. Welcome to Mind Pump. In the first half of this episode, we talk about how to accomplish more in 2023 by focusing on behaviors rather than results or outcomes. You're better off doing little things on a daily basis where you you actually accomplish them yeah. versus aiming for this one big thing and then maybe you hit it every once in a while. Yeah. These small wins lead to the state of mind that is more conducive to success. How to train a toddler to have a good relationship with food. Sal also talks about his brain boosting peptide protocol, as well as other topics. In the second half of the show, the guys coach four live callers on questions such as, I'm gonna hike the Appalachian Trail, it's 125 miles. How should I prepare for that? I'm suffering from hip pain later in the day after I squat, what can I do to correct that? I'm not seeing the gains I wanna see in the gym, could it be because I'm eating too much protein? And I'm super fatigued after working out. What's going on with me? What can I do to fix that? Finally, it's the new year. You may be wanting to lose a little weight. You may want to put on some muscle this year, and you may need a little bit of help and advice. Well, you can find that advice over at our other channel, Mind Pump Clips, right here on YouTube. All right, enjoy the show. If you want better chances at success, stress the behaviors that lead to the results. Don't stress the results. In other words, let's say you want to increase your knowledge. Don't say to yourself, I want to know more about the subject by the end of the year. Just say to yourself, I'm going to read five minutes every single day. When you stress the behaviors, the results happen. When you stress the results, oftentimes you don't get there. I would, yeah, I would take that a step further. I, you know, I was thinking about this with obviously the new year being here and everybody talking about goals and stuff like that. Yeah. I even like the idea of focusing on creating behaviors even more so than setting any goals. A hundred percent. It's just that listen, 100%. if you haven't, if you haven't read at all, setting this goal of, oh, I'm going to hit, I'm going to read so many books this year. Instead of doing that, just like, Hey, why don't you just read a page a day or yep. start with that and then catch the momentum after you've been doing that consistently for week in, week out, and then build upon that. And that, that same philosophy of reading applies to exercise, nutrition, and every other aspect. Yeah. So instead of saying, I'm going to lose 30 pounds this year, or I'm you know going to get in better shape. Say, okay, what are the what are the behaviors that lead to this, and which of these behaviors do I know I can do? And let me just focus on those and not even worry about the goal anymore. Yeah. So maybe it's okay. I want to lose 30 pounds this year. What can I do? And then you come down to it and you say, okay, well, I'm going to walk 10 minutes after breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So I'm going to do that every single day, and I'm going to avoid heavily processed foods six days a week. And I'm just going to focus on those things. I'm not going to worry about anything else. And then what ends up happening is the results, they come along, but it's the behaviors that lead to that. And it's the behaviors that stick around. That's what is, that's where the success comes you from. Got, you guys weren't well, in here uh, yesterday when I talked to Doug, about, were they, were you guys in here when you and I, I told you what Katrina and I did for New uh, Year's? They weren't in here now. Yeah. So we, we, it's interesting. You, I didn't know you were going to go this direction. Mm -hmm. And I actually forgot about this until you, until you just brought this up. So I'm going to pull it up so I can actually can list them. Hopefully I can get there in time. Um, Here we are. So Katrina and I did something a little bit different this year for um, our New Year's thing. And so what we did, and of course not pulling up, but I remember most of them, so it don't matter. We made a list of all of these behaviors that we want to do more of. And the idea was, and there's a list of about 10. And it has everything from a cold plunge to sauna, sauna to meditation to red light to exercise to go for a walk to read all these, so there's about 10 of them yeah. of these behaviors. And so we set a goal of to try and knock off at least two or three of these things every single day, two or three. That's it. Yeah. And what we said was that we're not even going to hold ourselves accountable to that, but the goal is to how long can we go into the year of never allowing a day to go by that we didn't do one of them. Mm. So yesterday we both did three different things in those categories and like we checked in with each other at the end of night and yeah, even you included- guys put a sticker on like a board? No, I mean like we, we know what they are. <laughs> we have stars. those, she has the list saved in her phone. One of them also was getting to bed uh, by 9.30, which mm. is tough for us to do, which we actually accomplished last night. Um, and so we, we just made a list like that and said, hey, and now mm. of course I would yeah. like to do all 10 every day. And, th and there might be some days where I get all 10 in a day, but I didn't want to make this mistake of saying, this goal of I'm going to do all 10 every single day. It's that here's a list of things I want to become behaviors in my life. And I'm going to try and set this thing where I do as many of them every single day. And I, what my real goal is, is to never allow a day go by that one of them. So, he, so here's why there's so much brilliance in that. Yeah, and I, and I, I know that that's based on your experience, right? Training clients and seeing what actually works. They actually did a study on 
this where they said where they found that small frequent successes led to more motivation and more of those motivated type feelings, which we're all looking for, right? When you feel motivated, it's easier to do the things that you think you need to do or you should do, right? When you feel unmotivated, it gets real tough. So what they found in the study was that small frequent wins or successes was more effective at producing that state of mind than infrequent large successes, okay? So you're better off doing little things on a daily basis where you you actually accomplish them yeah. versus aiming for this one big thing and then maybe you hit it every once in a while. Yeah. These small wins lead to the state of mind that is more conducive to success, which is that feel good, motivated state of mind. So you're you're far better off with those small steps than you are with the trying to hit the the bigger steps. This took me so long to figure out as a trainer. I wish I could go back in time for that first seven to eight years of training and train and teach people differently because it was such a big game changer later on that my success rate quadrupled with my mm -hmm. clients from just applying a strategy just like this one. I know, same thing. We always focused on too big of goals and even trying to reduce it down. It wasn't based on those every single day activities, like the ones that uh, it, it just takes very little friction to get involved and to do, uh, but then it, it just seriously like transcends into a bigger um bigger goals and bigger uh, lifestyle changes that happen as a result because it's just like uh, a bit of that um, snowball effect that yeah. you just get from that. Yeah, right. So I'll give you another example. This is a real clear one. I could say I'm going to cut my calories by 10%. I'm going to I'm going to reduce my caloric intake by 10%. So that's a goal. Or I could say I am no longer going to eat while distracted. I'm not going to eat while I'm on my phone. I'm not going to eat while I'm watching TV or on the computer. When I eat... I'm going to eat and I'm just going to be eating my food. And I'm going to be present. Now, what that does, studies show very consistently, it reduces your caloric intake by 10 to 15% by doing that. But it's a behavior. Rather than aiming for the 10% cut, yeah, yeah. I'm just going to change my behavior, the result of which being the automatic cut in calories. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to, to see which one is more likely to be yeah. where you'll be successful. Which one are you more likely to be consistent? One thing I did notice though too with clients is like they just weren't aware of a lot of their behaviors like that they would do on a daily basis. Totally. And would like almost their mind would play tricks on them to to shield and, and hide a lot of these behaviors where they would um, quickly consume food and not even realize like how many that was that they actually ate or, uh, you know, they would – uh, whatever it was like, if, if they really thought they were getting eight hours of sleep, they really kind of looked back at that and found that like only maybe five hours of it was quality sleep. <laughs> yeah. They woke up and, and, you know, yep. a couple times during the night. So I think like, you know, really kind of taking into account an accurate assessment of, of what you do on a daily basis, like the most you do, like the, the habits that you repeat the most. Yeah. You have to be, um, you have to try to consciously become aware you know, it's funny when you say that. I remember distinctly. This was r relatively recently um, with my with Aurelius. He's my my two year old. I'm like, you know, I want to be more present with him. I want to be more present with him. And so one, th I had this bad habit of when he would be playing or we'd be playing together, when he would go off to do some playing on his own. So him and I would play with a, with cars or something like that, right? And then he'd go off and then start playing by himself. And I'm like, oh, he's by himself. I'll just get on my phone and do some work. So he's over there. I'm over here doing this work on my phone. And I said to myself, you know what? I'm just going to be really present. At the very least, I'm just going to look at him and observe him and watch him and be, and you know what I noticed? And this broke my heart when I noticed this. I'm watching him. So I'm not on my phone. He's over there playing by himself. Every once in a while, he turns he looks up. to look and see if I'm yeah. watching him. Yeah. And I realized, holy shit, I wonder how many times yeah. he did that to me. And he looked, and I was on my phone. I had the same epiphany. Did yeah. you really? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's yeah, a tough watching one. watching my son play, and they they just want to know you're watching. That's totally. really all it is. It's like, and if you're not, even if it's just for a second, and then they see you on the phone, it's just like, it, it has to affect, uh, you know, part of their <laughs> psyche a little oh, bit. Oh, 100%. That was actually, that was one of the things. I mean, we, we didn't get everything right. It was one of the things we got right, because Katrina and I both agreed upon that early, and it doesn't mean there hasn't been slip ups where one of us starts with it, but it's so great that we both were on the same page and that, that the other one calls the other one out. Yeah. yeah. So like if I if we're all in the living room, Max, me and her, and one of us pulls our phone out, it's like, what are you doing? You know, get on your phone for and then like call the other one out and like, uh, right away. Slap it on my yeah. And so it's just been something that 
we've been really, we've been really good about that. And even like the TV, like for the most part, it's those. The, I don't want him to see me sucked into that. I, I can still manage to go. I can go to another room and like go up to the office and go do that if I really need to go take a call or I really need to go answer something because that happens, right? Yeah. There's times when you're running a business that we have to put fires out or yeah. you don't you don't anticipate that, and so there's ways yeah, to life. Yeah, maneuver around it. But I think it's so important that when there's play time and you're right there and you're interacting that he doesn't see you like that. You know. Well, you know too. Like I've actually had to verbally announce that I'm doing emails or I'm on, I'm working, you know, and it, it sounds ridiculous and silly. I got to do that. But like, I'll be like for 20 minutes right now, like I'm doing emails, I'm on the phone, like doing work. It, like the kids know I think I'm doing that's that. smart. I think that's smart because you're showing the intention yeah. and, and they're not just thinking or the dad even scrolling. On, yeah. yeah. Or, or subconsciously. Like, yeah. Farting around on there. Like just, you know, trying yeah. to ignore. By, by the way, dude, when you do this, because we were pretty good with TV, but recently we're like, let's almost eliminate it to the point where the only amount of TV that we'll let them watch is about 15 minutes before bed, like a treat. Okay. So get ready for bed. 15 minutes. We set a timer. He watched. So other than that, there's nothing. Okay. It's a lot of work because you have to be on all the time. So, you know, we had this break where we were off and I was home with, you know, with Jessica and we didn't use the TV at all. And you were on, like you, it's not like you, you can't put the TV on and have, it's so alluring to you know, turn it on to give yourself a break. Yeah. Right. So you don't do it. It's like, you're signing up for a lot of work, but I think the, 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 the you know, it's totally worth it. I mean, we were talking about it and Jessica and I are like, you know what? Uh, you can't become a better parent without becoming a better person. You have to become a better person. You got to adapt. Yeah. That's it. Or bottom die. line. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's, it's kind of like the advice so that we give around like fitness. Like we had live callers and we, we talked, we talked to a caller and said, you know, about like mobility and stuff and like, it's something he avoids. And so it would be one of those things that I would tell someone like, just do this and then see for yourself. And then you make that call. I yeah. feel the same way kind of with like parenting in a situation like this. Right. Like you don't know that you don't know. Like I have so many friends that that have never actually disciplined themselves to take the the iPad or TV yeah. out of their lives and then actually do the work of like, oh my God, this is an exhausting week. We're not doing any iPad. But pay attention to the kids' behavior. Totally. Yeah. And it's, it's it was so obvious. You to, can see the the the, the yes, difference when we, they go we, back we on. We did it. We did it enough times difference. of oh, let's try and let it in. Oh, let's try and let it out. Oh, let's give her this. Let's give them this much time. Let's only give them this much time. And we played with it enough times to go like there is a clear, very clear difference in and 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 even an amount of time. Like you talk about a small window, like fifteen. We found even even up to an hour is not bad. As soon as it gets beyond a total of an hour of time in front of any sort of tech like that, the iPad or the television, we see negative effects. Like more irritable. Irritability, yeah. the behavior. They doesn't listen as well as he doesn't go down. He doesn't go down for bed as easily. He doesn't sleep as long. Like, I mean, a whole host of things, which, by the way, only makes all those things more difficult. So you think as a parent... You are you are helping yourself out by putting them in front of that iPad for an hour or two, but then what you don't realize is you make nighttime and bedtime yep. and 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 them listening to you more difficult. Yeah. So you really are and then just you want to use a TV more. That's right. So you're really only trading one for the other. You're really you're you're temporarily making it easier for you in that moment, but you actually make the rest of the day more difficult for yourself. And I think when you when you tease it in and out enough times as a parent, if you're aware, if you're paying attention, just like somebody who is learning about eating correctly for the first time and pulling certain foods that don't agree with them out. If you're become aware and you pay attention, it's not hard to close you. No, it's not hard to convince you to do that. No, you can see the value. And you know, by, uh, speaking of awareness, you know, that kids are the most present people ever. Like children are so present and aware of everything that's going on at all moments with the, with TV and electronics and that kind of stuff does is actually teaches them to not be present and not be aware. But when you take that away, like, you know, when little kids, like I, like I said, I have a toddler and his language is developing so rapidly and he's saying things and phrases that we didn't necessarily teach him. He's just saying them. And then you realize like he hears and sees everything. They have to be present. It's a new world to them. So yeah. everything, they're paying attention to moods and what you're saying and changes in the room and what's happening. And what the, what electronic does is actually teaches them to disconnect. And there was that study I brought up a while ago that shows that it, it prevents children from learning how to regulate their emotions mm. because they learn how to soothe and disconnect. Yep. So they're, ah, I'm upset. TV, boom, disconnect. 
they never learn or they 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 don't learn as well the skill of emotional it's regulation. Way of coping, yeah. Which is super. So what they said in that study was if you are going to do stuff like that, like watch TV or whatever, to interact with them mm -hmm. at the at the moment to make it. Which to me experience. is is exactly what I see when I don't when I allow them when, you just when put I put it on. Yeah, when I put it on, and allow them do it, it. The things that I'm challenged with yeah. is the, his behavior and his ability, like. It, Max is so good about his routine and his time, the things that he does, that if, you know, it's okay, it's bath time. Okay, you know, okay, daddy, two minutes. Okay, two more minutes. Yeah. And then we go up. All right. And he's like, if it was one of those days where he got more, and we saw this over vacation because we were a lot, we were looser on vacation with some of the, the tech and stuff. If I allow him to do that, and then, okay, it's time about, no, I don't want to. Like, what? Yeah. No? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you tell me no. Like, you don't even tell me no. But he does tell me no then. Yeah. And then when I'm, yes, you are. No, no, no. And I don't want to. Later, daddy, later. And it's just like, I see that clear difference of when it's been a day where we've been outside playing mm -hmm. and we've been doing physical activity and it's time. He's like ready. What's up, everybody? Today's giveaway uh, is MAPS Aesthetic. This is a great bodybuilding inspired workout program. You can get it for free. If you win, here's how you enter. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel uh, and turn on notifications. Do all of those things. And then if we declare you the winner, we'll let you know in the comment section. That's the only place we'll let you know that you won free access to Maps Aesthetic. Also, we have a sale going on. We've created three workout bundles. Each one gives you up to nine months of planned workouts, up to nine months of exercise programming, video demos, everything you need, okay? Here are the three bundles. The first one is the new to weightlifting bundle. The second one is the body transformation bundle. And the third one is the new year extreme intensity bundle. All of these bundles will save you tremendous amounts of money because we discounted them huge, like up to like 60, 70% off. Uh, and you can find all of them if you click on the link at the top of the description below. And that's where you get set up. All right, here comes the show. So kind of similar topic. So we've been learning uh, about teaching young, young, young children how to have a good relationship with food, which is different than what I would have thought. So I always thought, well, you teach the kids, this is healthy, this is unhealthy, you talk to them, this is what we're eating, this is what we're not eating. But I'm what we're learning, and this actually is quite effective, I'm, I'm seeing it now with my toddler, is you do sacrifice initially a little bit of nutrition so that the child uh, develops a good relationship with food. So here's what you do. You set out three or four things one or two of them, you know that they like. The other one of them, you know that maybe they'll eat. And the other one that's kind of experimental. You put it out in front of them and you say, hey, it's you know it's snack time, time to eat. And then you let them eat what they want and not eat what they don't want. And you continue to introduce the foods that you want them to. And eventually they start to pick it up and eat the foods. Mm -hmm. And what it does, they develop this better relationship with food versus this, finish this, they chose don't, it that don't eat that, yeah. you can't eat this, that's unhealthy, eat that, that's, yeah. that's good. And it's working. I would have never imagined that yeah. it would have worked this way to where now I'm introducing these foods. I'm not saying anything. I put it in front of him. And the first 10 times, he won't touch the new thing. He'll just leave yeah. it. That's fine. No big deal. Yeah. Hey, snack time is over. Or can I throw this away? Okay, blah, whatever. Well, and it's such a trip too. I, I noticed this uh, even with my kids and especially Everett because he's the most picky that uh, their palate changes. And it, and it goes like it, every... I want to say like almost like on a five year schedule with him, like all of a sudden he's like wants to try all this new stuff. And he was like eating fish and we're just like Courtney and I are looking at each other like, what you want to have this? And, and it just like, you, you give up hope for a while because you're just like, I don't know if he's ever going to like come around. We're always going to be like trying these methods and doing this, this like, well, let's try this method. And, and, uh, eventually just, you know, like overnight, he just decided on his own. Like it just, I think it just really had to be on his terms. That's just his personal. That's, now, well, that's exactly it because. Now, when you look back though, Justin, do you, because I know that you guys had different uh, like consistencies with Everett and Ethan around their eating. Do you attribute any of that to the the eating behaviors that you guys created? Everything from breastfeeding to the whole foods that you were preparing yourself forever and ethan do you think that had anything to do with it or do you think it's purely they're just they're yeah um yeah i think you know i know what you're talking about like when i was describing a little bit of a difference there but like uh, and uh, courtney corrected me she heard that episode <laughs> it's like no i did the same thing like she's like breastfed him same amount of time if not longer had like pre-made uh, a lot of those um blended options where you put like you know spinach and yeah, kale yeah. and all that and then you know had had that uh 
and, and fed him with that. So it, it was just interesting that he just completely had a different palate and, and was just very much drawn to only like three foods and, and was like all like carb heavy. Um, but yeah, it was, I think it's, it's for them, for Ethan Everett, it's very much of a personality thing. And, um, it, again, it's, I don't know specifically that it's like, I could, I could just divide it in half of like, like Ethan is completely Courtney personality and Everett's completely like me, but it's very close. Yeah. Um, and so I was very much like that, you know, when I was a kid, uh, it was very hard for me to eat new foods and to be, <laughs> um, convinced otherwise, cause I wanted to buck, you know, I wanted yeah. to buck the system. Well, so that's, so that's just it. Right. So this has totally changed my, <clears throat> my paradigm on the whole thing. The most important skill you could develop in a modern world around food is to have a good relationship with food. In the past, it was understanding that we don't have a lot of food, I gotta eat all this, or I'm gonna miss these nutrients, or I'm not gonna be healthy. Right. So you look, and that stuck around. That's how we were raised, that's how our parents were raised, and you know, definitely our grandparents. But today, there's so much food everywhere that the adults <clears throat> that succeed in this environment they just have a good relationship with food. They don't use it to, you know, to to lull themselves. They don't use it to distract themselves. They don't use it when they're depressed. Mm -hmm. They just have. So the most important thing, and I totally would, I would have said completely different if you asked me five years ago. The most important thing today, what that I think now today with my youngest is my youngest kids is the relationship part, not the like you have to eat that, you don't have to eat that, but rather giving them a sense of a feeling of autonomy, learning to kind of feed themselves, kind of creating barriers that they're not necessarily aware of. Like I give them the options, but I mm -hmm. give them enough options. And I know that there's at least one or two things that I know they'll eat so that they can. And if they want more of that, that's totally fine. And then there's meal time. That's the other boundary. This is meal time. This is snack time. Oh, you're hungry. Snack time will be here in 20 minutes or whatever. Yeah. That's pretty much it. And it's working. It's really yeah. Weird. And to, to kind of, you know, go further into that, like what we found too, is that um, Everett was really into the cooking process of it all. So he got into that and Courtney started to really kind of work with him on like creating recipes and doing stuff with her. That's max. max so well. it was like game changer though. He'd actually eat it then. Yeah. You know? they cook it. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So it's like, duh, it's like such a no brainer, but we just didn't include him in that process. You know, in the beginning. what an interesting thing. I've never thought about that. Although, so we're pretty lucky, right? Max is not a picky eater. I mean, he will really eat uh, pretty much anything that we'll put in front of him. Although he does gravitate towards carbohydrates more and I have to be, we have to be more actively aware, but that's just on us. That's just us making the choice and making sure we put that in front of him. Mm -hmm. But I do know he gets really excited to try the food that he makes. Mm -hmm. So that's a cool strategy. If there is anything that uh, I struggle to get him to eat more of is to actually probably have him prepare it in the kitchen with Katrina because he loves to do that. He absolutely loves to cook with her. And anytime. you could do that when they're even younger. I mean, because Max is, what, is he three? three yeah, he just turned, or? yeah, he's barely, well, he's three and a half now, right? Yeah. So, but he's yeah. been doing that for the last year. Yeah, because you can have him do something. Like, I yeah, have a really, yeah. it's like, he, he'll like grab the seasoning for the meat. Like, yeah. he can't do anything else. So yeah. I'll just have him like sprinkle it on or whatever. Yeah, he Perfect. just loves to get up on, like, we have a stool to get him up so he's at the height of the, oh, the like counter. Oh, like one of those Montessori. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So he just gets up there and like, you know, Katrina, hold this, you know, hand me mm -hmm. this, pass me that. And he's not really doing anything. But Dude, speaking <laughs> of food, speaking of food, I had a little panic attack. Uh, over the weekend, uh, we went to uh, Whole Foods to go do grocery shopping. And I'm over there and I'm going to go buy eggs. No eggs. Not no eggs that I yeah, like. Yeah, there's a shortage going right now. No eggs at all. Yeah. So I'm like, that's what? weird. When have you ever been to the grocery store and there's no eggs? So I'm like, this is weird. Uh -huh. So finish our grocery shopping, go to Safeway. No eggs. Bro. No eggs at all. We were considering getting chickens again because we did see that. Like, it's crazy. They're, they're like, Hard to get right now. There's a sh there was an egg shortage yeah. going on. Now I found some and and now they're available again. But there's an egg shortage. There's going so on. many goddamn chickens. How's that possible? I know. How like what is happening? Bird flu. Yeah. Is no, that, I swear to God. Yeah, is that flu. true? Yeah. yeah. Maybe yeah. Doug can confirm it. I but right. yeah, I looked it up yesterday. Yeah. Bird yeah. flu. So there's literally so egg prices are going to go. Th I'm sure going to go through the roof. Yeah. But you know the sense. It's so okay. This is so weird. Never have I ever lived during a time where there was a staple like where I go to the grocery store and there's a, a staple food that's not on the shelf. I've never experienced that before. Yeah. Okay? That's, that's like odd. bread, milk, meat, you know, fruit, just toilet eggs, paper. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's the only thing you've experienced. Now <laughs> we get toilet paper. Yeah, I know. That was dumb. <laughs> but but do you go to the grocery store and see no eggs? And then I'm like, uh, uh oh. Is this like part of the like supply chain thing? Like, what are we doing? <laughs> I know. What the yeah, hell's going on weird. here? They yeah. call it avian flu. Avian oh, flu. Yeah. yeah, not bird Which flu. Is... Why not bird? Does it I think that's what humans get is bird flu. I'm not sure, but 
I f- Avian flu is I feel the like technical. Th- I feel like PETA said that that was offensive or some shit. That's what happened. <laughs> uh, okay. uh, don't don't call them birds. Yeah, I mean, d- is there stats on like how many how many how many like flocks it it knocked out or I mean what's happening? Here? Like, <laughs> knocked just, the flock I mean, out. It, I mean, or is this or is this <laughs> how we? I mean, well, this, this is how you know, sheep we are, bro. We're such sheep. You know, what I'm saying like, oh, there's no eggs. Oh, Google. Oh, Google tells us there's a perfect. Okay, that's <laughs> <laughs> oh. all I needed. I yeah. just, so it was it's like Foster Farms, and like scene. like yeah. getting like hammered right now like what's going on <laughs> foster <fire. laughs> yes. obliterating I want, I want more answers you know what i'm saying <laughs> yeah. they're yeah. still cranking away yeah. making great money did it really freaking hurt them that it's much or what maybe they, maybe they met with the beers uh was it the the, the beers diamond mine people yeah. how do yeah. we do what you guys do? right right yeah. so regulating eggs the same way they do diamonds kill Come half on. the chickens trust me it'll work yeah eggs will go through the room Are you getting anything doug i yeah 10 percent hike in price um yeah that's it i'm, I'm not getting I'm not getting any details about how many chickens are knocked out Boy, here. Man. Maybe I tell you what, just, just that tinfoil hat is starting to get more secure on my head more and more. Oh, I tell I'm you. telling you, man. <laughs> Justin and I, man. Oh, my God, dude. I, I saw that. I, I, I'm so sad to be right. That's all I'm going to say right now. I wish <laughs> yeah. I wasn't right. What's it's the, it's the worst. Dude, speaking of the grocery store, and I don't know if I ever got, told you guys this a while ago. I just remembered it today. I was like, I got to bring this up. So years, this is the weirdest. This was the weirdest experience. One of the weirdest experiences for me. So- when I was in junior high, I, uh, junior high was a tough time for me, and I got in a lot of scuffles and fights. And at one point, I got jumped. I told you guys this uh, in the in the boys' bathroom. I, I, I walked in, a bunch of dudes walked in, shut the door behind me, and there was one guy in particular who was kind of leader, and it was like this gang or whatever. And I got jumped by like five dudes, right? And it was like, you know, it sucked. It was traumatizing. After that, I went after the guy. I got in the fight. Anyway, I got suspended. It was a whole big deal. Well, anyways, years later, as a grown adult, so I'm like, you know, late 30s. I'm at the grocery store. And dude taps on my shoulder and I turn around and it's the dude, the la- the main dude that jumped me with all those other kids. And he goes, Sal, man, I got to apologize to you, man. And he's like, I, I'm a pastor at this church. Oh, and wow. The whole, he became this total Christian, was apologizing. And I was so torn as a grown man <laughs> yeah, right. because part of me was like, like, yeah, now let's see you try that now. I've been now. training, dude. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've been dreaming about getting, getting you know what I mean? Like, like ever since I was a kid. I used to see Sal's like fist just. Yeah. Ooh, I want to. Yeah. I, I, I was so torn. Like, part of me was like, "Well, that's nice." The other part of me was like, "You know, can I get like one?" Yeah. You, yeah. Know? yeah. you really feel bad? Yeah. Let me just hit yeah. you real one time. Yeah, you're really <laughs> ruining my fantasy. Let's see what happens. Yeah, I got some stats here for oh, you on, the, on the birds. Okay. Deadliest in U.S. history. I guess bird flu is a correct name as well. Uh, the worst poultry health disaster in U.S. history. Fifty uh, two point seven million birds dead. Whoa! This is a chick apocalypse. Okay. All right, I feel better now. No, I mean not like. Wait that's a, a minute. Thing, Fifty two but- million. Yeah. Oh what? my god, that's crazy. Well, man. and okay, on average, do you remember Justin what a what a what a, a chicken produces? What's it? An egg for uh, like is per it, month it, or day? Yeah, is it, are they it's uh, like one a day? A couple of eggs a day. Per, like, per one though. Per one. Yeah. yeah. One one is one so a day. Depends. Yeah. Well, I had a chicken that produced at least two to three a day. But, yeah. I think wow. average is around one maybe. Yeah. Probably I think one one, one, one a day. So that's so, fifty two million eggs a day that were short. Yeah. You know Basically. Yeah. Holy cow. Yeah, that's a big short, is it? That's, that's yeah, that makes sense. That sucks. That makes sense. Right? This is wild. Yeah. It's more logical than the toilet paper. What else is going to happen? I swear to God, man. What's going on here? Uh, yeah. Uh, um, so you guys, I, don't, I told locusts. you guys. Locusts. That's what's going to happen. Great. Okay. If, you know what? Sorry. If we see locusts and boils, yeah. <laughs> I'm done. I'm going to tell you right now. We start, uh, if yeah. I start to get boils uh-huh. and we see locusts flying through San Jose, Bro. it's done. Yeah. We're out of here. I repent. Uh, so um, I told you guys, I'm going to tell the audience just so they can follow along. I'm starting on, so at mphormones.com, <laughs> I told them that my goal is I want cognitive performance. Like I really, I don't care about muscle fat loss. I'm happy with all that. I want, I want them brain gains. Yeah. I want you to put me on like a peptide combo or whatever that is going to maximize cognitive I performance. I told them the same thing. You got, okay. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I ju- today I just started. So I'm obviously too early to notice anything, but I'll, I'll, I'll let everybody knows, you know, what happens. I told them to dumb me down. Just make me sexy. <laughs> <laughs> make me as hot as possible. Yeah, yeah, just, if it makes me stupid, that's fine. Don't cut any corners. So, so, yeah. So, 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 just give me yeah. whatever so it takes. Gotta hold up the handsome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know? yeah. We'll let those uh, other two nerds carry the show. Us and our big ass heads. <laughs> Justin and I are going to be... 
The smart guys. Look, I just, oh, Adam. Just, <laughs> he's so, such a simpleton. He's so handsome. <laughs> he's, he's so handsome, yeah, though. But Fuck. God damn it, you get a pass. <laughs> yeah. Did you really? You didn't say that. No, like, I didn't say that. Yeah. Are you doing? Are you, you talking I got to gotta meet with them. So I'm the last one to go get my. I had my blood. Why do you work. wait so long? Oh, always dude, such a, every time. You know, it's like you would think I was doing a bunch of stuff, you know? For this oh, <laughs> so, <of> course, I <laughs> set you up for that. Um, you you um, would think. So you guys you know, have so much free time. Yeah, yeah, it must be nice, you know? I actually had a. I had a blood work appointment on Friday and I don't even remember why we had to cancel it. I had to cancel it though. I canceled it and, and something else came up. So um, I got to reschedule and I will, and I'm looking forward to, to meet with them and I'll, I'll have them put me on a stack. So we'll see what, we'll see what I Dude, do. Did I tell you guys the nurse was like flirting with me when she took my blood? No. At least I thought she was flirting. Do you think was everybody's so flirting with you? Huh? Bro? I wish I was in the room. Huh? So I could <laughs> confirm this. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. I don't <laughs> think everybody's <laughs> flirting with me. Just, why you make that up? Dude, she time? wants me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys just, just you can't just make things up. I don't make it. <laughs> say, somebody get my back right now, Doug, Justin. I'm sorry. I was getting your back right now. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was reiterating. Listen, that guy was looking at me for a while. No, I'm in there, and the nurse, the nurse goes to take my blood pressure. And she puts the cuff on me, and it didn't fit. She's like, "Oh, yeah. <laughs> you have big arbs. <laughs> big arms. That's all she said. That's yeah, all it was. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> but I made sure to text you know my wife afterwards. Uh, yeah. Like, babe, I don't know. This nurse babe, I love you so much. Hey. This, 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 the nurse was commenting on the size of my arms. Yeah. She said I had to use an yeah. obese person's cuff. That's what she said. <laughs> that's right. I'm gonna jump. I'm gonna jump ahead of you on this one because I got okay. a massage in uh, Iceland. Oh, what? And I know you're gonna bring this up. Well, <laughs> <laughs> what do you I mean? That's you, weird, honey. Justin. I'm just saying. Tell okay, so I heard you telling I heard you telling Sal yesterday, and it, so you had these uh, well, hot springs, correct? Yeah, and it's all geothermic heating, so it's all like part of the hot springs and stuff that they have around there. And you actually got a massage while floating in one of these hot yeah. springs. So it's like that sounds outside. cool in itself. So super cold, but super warm cold ass water. out the surface, and then warm water. Uh, and so they have like these yoga mats that they're, that are like extra thick, and they kind of float. And so they put this like warm blanket on you and then you have this like pillow and then like towel over your eyes and all that stuff. And um, yeah, so they like, they still use some kind of oil and, and they kind of lift your back up and massage your back and then, you know, massage your neck and all the tension spots and the head. And it, dude, it was fantastic. And mm -hmm. I thought it was going to be crap because it's like you're floating around like in water. Yeah, I was yeah. like, how can this be any good? Uh, now you say they, like who's they that massage you? Uh, <laughs> Do you well, get massaged by guys or girls? No, maybe? no, I don't. No, it's, it's all always girls. Okay, yeah. so, <laughs> I'm the same way too. I'm just saying. I'm not, I, I don't that, enjoy getting like some dude. I can't relax. That's why it's Katrina. Because yeah. obviously that's the Katrina's profession, and that was like one of my stipulations. Was like, no, it has to be a female. It's like it's not like a sexual thing. It's that I can't no. relax with a dude rubbing me. It's just really. Like, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's just, just not can't. my thing. Yeah. And you I mean, know, my, it could be your thing. My, yeah. my brother-in-law like massages. He'll come by and he'll yeah. like rub my shoulders. I can relax a little bit when he does that. But if I'm like naked and he's rubbing all over my body, just can't. That's relax. a different level. Challenges yeah, you too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I start to like too me. much. I feel like, like I gotta confused. be prison tight. Like, oh, yeah, what we, am I doing? Quit this. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't like this confused voter. It's so confusing. Um, no, so so it was. But yeah, she was mildly attractive. Yeah, it was oh, wow. mildly. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> just totally, it's like totally downplaying she, it. She had a my touch wife. of attractiveness. She, pretty, pretty attractive. <laughs> Which uh, so this was in Iceland. So this is probably a tall like. Yeah, some kind of Scandinavian blood going on there. Yeah. <laughs> How was your trip over there, by the way? I'm going I'm to rescue you right now. <laughs> Pull him out. Pull him out. I, I'm just being honest. How was the trip over there? So you go to Iceland. No, it was, it was great. Uh, you know, Iceland itself, because we went, that was the second half of the trip. So I'm totally doing this in out of order. But uh, Iceland was amazingly stunning, gorgeous um, environment. Like it, it almost was like, feels like you're in an alien planet because- First of all, you only have like four hours of daylight because it's uh, winter. And uh, so you'll see the sun rise at like 10, 30, 11 o'clock. And then it, it goes till about four o'clock. Wow. And it never gets higher than where you see it like set. So it was just like barely above. Oh, weird. Yeah. The, the skyline. And then it would just go across like this and then go down. Oh, wow. And it was, so it was like so trippy. So it was like nighttime most of the time? I mean, it felt, yeah. I mean, for the most part, it was night. Like, Weird. we did a lot of things at night. Wait, wait. So you you don't see the sun do this? No. It, it, the placement it the just kind of stayed because we're at the very top. That would trip me out. Yeah. And you also so see, you see the moon, like this. too. 
So the moon, like it was like visible still, and you see the sun kind of doing this across and dropping down. And Weird. Then, yeah, it was. It, it, it literally felt like now, it was on Hoth. Now, they say that cold weather and darkness tends to affect people's moods and personalities. How are the people over there? Are they yeah. Over there? Yeah. So, I mean, I... I found Iceland to be amazing. Like it, it, it was great. There was a distinctive difference in culture and people with Scotland and Iceland. Oh, really? And I think the cold weather and the dark nights it has to like play a factor. Really? <laughs> Dude, are people not happy? Like very like no bullshit. You know, like <laughs> like we don't joke here. You know, wow. <laughs> <laughs> like like it was like. Some like we had like a, a coin toss whether or not we were going to get good service or like extremely rude service. Really? Yeah, yeah. It was very much of a coin flip, uh, and it was usually the younger crowd. Like a lot of the younger people were super cool, and nice, but like the old, you know, dogs that were there. Dude, we had this tour guide that literally was trying to leave me. I I stepped out like at this this stop to get food, and I was trying to get it, and then. I saw something that I went to go purchase. Like I put this shirt on. Oh, this is sick. I'm going to get this. And like, oh yeah, go in there. I was literally a minute late. And there's like, he's like yelled at Courtney and her sister and the other girl we're traveling with and was like yelling at them because they brought food. I was like, you don't do that. And this is not a cafeteria here. And blah, blah, blah. Like chewing them out. And he's like, where's the, other? like, he counted everybody and saw I wasn't there. And so he was like, get in, we're leaving him. And like starts the bus up and was like trying to move out. My sister-in-law steps in between him and like puts her, her foot outside. So she's blocking the door from closing. He's like, you're not leaving. Wow. <laughs> like, wow, bro. Yeah. That's crazy. He was a dick, dude. Uh, I'll roll him under the bus. Like, wow. <laughs> David is his name. Uh, anyway. <laughs> fuck that David guy. and I said, fuck <laughs> Yeah. He's just a prick. Wait, okay. Which one did you like better? Uh, so, I mean, that's tough. They're both awesome experiences. Like, so it was... I liked Scotland because it's like, I have ties to that somewhat. Like I know like some of my ancestors came, it's kind of like, you know, yeah. identified being Italian. It's like, I kind of identify with that, but also too, just the people are so overly welcoming and, and hilarious and like super dry, sarcastic. Um, like everybody's busting my balls the whole time there. Like, uh, so I had to drive on the wrong side of the road. And that was like the first time I ever done that. Because we do it the right way here. We, it, it's well, the right wrong. side anyway. Yeah. Did I did I see you? It was a manual too, and manual. See so the shift that that, that had to have been weird right there. Weird, and also too like so we had to go from Edinburgh, which is the city, which is shielded by a lot of like so not a lot of the snow and wind and all that come there, and so we we're going up to the Highlands, and uh, as we did that, a storm rolled in, and I'm like first time like driving the stick on the right on the left side of the road and then going up and then it just started bombing us with snow and I'm two wheel drive. Like oh it's God. going all over the place on me. There's these roundabouts. Like, so they had roundabouts in the middle of the freeway, dude. And it was so confusing. Like there was oh, like, because you got to go left. Yeah. You, you have to go left to get oh my God. around and then you have oh, to know wow. which stop to take. And so I missed one or two and then we're, I was at this back country, just like driving like a one lane road. And I didn't know like the protocol of like when I ran into somebody, like who goes first and all that there. One biggest thing was like when I had to get back on the freeway, there was this sign. So you look at uh, like an entryway to get onto the freeway. There's these two signs and it was a circle with an X and uh, it was red circle with an X in blue. Now tell me what the fuck that means. I mean, I would stop probably. You stop. Yeah, that's what I would do. You don't stop. You don't stop. No, no. You're not supposed to stop. That's, oh, that's what that means? <laughs> don't that stop? Means don't, <laughs> don't stop. <laughs> don't stop. You can't go all the way through to the freeway. I was like, no. <laughs> so I, like, I pulled over and I was like, Courtney, like, Google this. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, panicking, like sweating, dude. Oh, my God. Dude. What a and, shit show. Uh, oh, man. And, and so we read up on that. I was like, whew. So I... I I at least was glad I pulled over and then this car kind of went past me like, oh, I guess you do go mm -hmm. and, and fall. But it, there was a few snafus, but not too <clears throat> like terrible. But yeah, it was, <laughs> driving was nuts. Was there a name of those Mercedes 
buggies that you sent to those were sick. Oh yeah. Is there but those are I've never seen those I, in the United States. They're picture. like inflatable. You like, didn't see that? No, no. What oh, was they were so, sick. Yeah, I I don't know the name of them, but they look like, like okay, so, like Tundra vehicles. Did you say okay, so they the were group? they were like a crop okay, you know the um the Mercedes like uh Sprinter uh, vans. Sprinter vans? Yeah. They kind of look like that, but a little beefier with these massive mud tires on them. Massive tires. Dude. Yeah, they look so sick. It looked like a like a toy. It looked like I want one. I the the guy was telling me like how incredibly <clears throat> difficult it is to like maintain them and service them and stuff. But so they when they get to like real deep powder and snow, they they deflate the tires like you would like you've seen some of those yep. in, like a, a Pismo in yeah. in the sand. Uh huh. Very similar to that. So they like deflate it a bit so it gets that extra surface area. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of what the so we took those to a tour up to the, they had a glacier that you, you take like these snowmobiles and you just bomb it up this glacier. And, um, they had, which kind of was a bummer in the tour. We, we got like all the way up there and we were supposed to go through this ice cave and it was the weather conditions got crazy and it like covered like the, the cave. So we had to turn around and come oh, back. Wow. I was like, no, oh, my Instagram moment. No. <laughs> <laughs> <My Instagram moment. laughs> you know, that's a good, what you just said is actually, I was going to tell Doug that when we got, we got caught in a storm up in Tahoe. We, or we just barely missed it. I drove through more of it. Um, and Doug has had the BMW, which has got four wheel drive. And so he went and got chain or he went and put chains on my, like, you don't know, cha chains on that. I was going to tell him to just flatten his tires. Cause that's a, a, a great strategy for someone who's driving. What do you do? You just let you just bring the, yeah, you just bring down, like 10, 15 PSI down, out mm -hmm. and it, and, and it lets the air out of the tires. And so you they better traction. Yeah. Better track. So when they're all tight and airtight yeah, yeah, yeah. and then snow, it it's also, them, yeah. it just spins like crazy where mm -hmm. if they're deflated, is there, you get better traction. Are there times when you need, chains even with all wheel drive or four wheel drive so what so the chp will uh enforce it if you have uh street tires and not uh off-road or aggressive like oh, okay. my truck doesn't ever need never okay. right like so even in the like blizzard conditions like you're you're still fine with tires like that and technically if you have good all-wheel drive you still should be pretty fine and the the, the new cars Especially like the rover and stuff like that, like those things, yeah. it, it 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 senses a tire starting to spin and it will shut that one off. The other one overcorrects, and those things are really really stable, even with their like their quote unquote street. Yeah, tires. you ever drive an old car on, on wet roads and stuff like that? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's why oh, Doug was man. a little nervous. Like his BMW is a, a little bit older, right? You're almost like ten. Yeah, years and old. I'd driven to Reno that morning, and on the way back, my my car was definitely drifting. Yeah, oh, really? and so I said, well, I better just put the chains on for extra, uh, you know safety yeah i went i went and bought them for my niece who had a you know she had an all-wheel drive subaru and i still put them on hers which was necessary because i even drove her i drove it around and i came to stop at the stop sign and went <laughs> right through the stop sign <laughs> i was like okay you, to, you know i've like never it's put, taken me you know yeah, i've like never even put chains on a car i've never even had to do it yeah they're pretty easy. never done it really yeah yeah, yeah. i okay. mean yeah, yeah. it's not that yeah. You can YouTube Plus anything two, today. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? True. Like, yeah, you can, it's pretty. It's pretty easy. I know Doug fucked around with his for a little while, but I think he had. You had ones were they older? Did you have them for a long time? Uh, no, I actually bought them last year. Oh really? Uh, yeah. So I we had this young guy named Max. He came up with uh, Doug a, delegated. That's why. Yo, yeah. So <laughs> he delegated I, well, I was, to a sixteen year old. <laughs> yeah. So he, had, he was, yeah. he's a smart kid. He got on YouTube and he kind of figured it out. Come to he put him on the wrong wheels and then Backwards. he put him on upside down. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Oops. but anyway, we got it figured out in the end. Uh, yeah, I really not use chains a lot. So I got kind of wet out there cause it was snowing pretty hard. So, you know what actually, cause Katrina was like, you're so crazy when we get in these moments where like, we're driving through the blizzard and she's like, you, and my niece was freaking out and like yeah. worried about her. And I did all our change like that. She's like, you don't even worry. About it. I was like, I don't. The snow doesn't scare me as much as actually the the rain and water on the road. Yeah, of mm -hmm. course. Because that shit, you'll be driving 60, 70 because it's, it's unpredictable. And, and all of a sudden you'll see a, a puddle in the or freeway. Or you won't even see it. And, or you won't it. see it and you hit your wheel and that shit will jank you. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I'm i more tense in the, and so we went down the hill in the blizzard, totally fine, whatever. We drive a little bit slower and stuff like to get down there, which took an hour and a half to get down the hill. Then we hit into Sacramento city area and it was just, pouring and i was more tense 
driving in that all the way home than mm -hmm. I was in the blizzard. Because I feel like in the blizzard, everyone's on full alert. Yeah. You're driving 40 miles less than you would be. The rain, people be bombing still. And you're, yeah. fl you're flying on the freeway because it's just rain. And then all of a sudden, you hit an area where there, and it just pulls the, oh. the vehicle. Yeah, I got both when I was in Scotland because it, it was more like rainy. And then you kind of went up and then it started snowing once I got higher in elevation. But dude, I had like everything thrown at me possible, dude. And then I was driving the, you know, the wrong side of the road. I, I'm going to stop and make a total commercial right now, though, because <laughs> like I actually I, I did a really good job of packing the right clothes for each environment. Yeah. Uh, and I I didn't know ahead of time that Viore had this rain jacket that's super light. Like it, it it's just like um, it's thin material, but uh, repelled like all the water and everything. So I just layered up. Oh, nice. So I was like, it was cold, but in rainy. So it was like kind of difficult to gauge like what exactly to wear. And so it was cool because I could just put it on top of whatever I was wearing. And then I How, didn't have wow, any. I they made a raincoat. Yeah. And it's sick too. I have it over there, but it's like stylish and whatnot. And so I prefer magic. stuff like that too because of. The, the how quick I warm up the temperature and exactly. it's like you have some big thick heavy coat on that it protects you or some of that but then you're and like you're, sweating dude, inside that was my battle in Iceland I had to have like a down jacket and like I had to like the first day I didn't do it yeah froze my chonies off like, have you ever yeah. noticed my, what I snowboard in? I snowboard oh, yeah. in like like, thin, like just like this, just oh, like that yeah, Viore jacket, is. a real thin, it's water repellent, mm -hmm. so it, it, I won't get wet in it, but I'd rather wear a sweater underneath, and then when I get hot, I just peel a sweater off yeah. and then have a t-shirt underneath, so you peel versus like, cause then I have a jacket that's like thick inside, and it's a snowboard jacket, and oh man, I'm like dying by midday for I sure. I go inside, oh my God, I was like sweating. Yeah, I would, you see, I would snowboard in that. Yeah. That's a, it's that's sick, a, I didn't dude. even know they had that jacket. Yeah, that's cool. me either. I, I was totally digging it. So. Hey, I want to bring up a study with you guys um, because it's a new study and it's a study on strength training and diet. And I'm going to read to you some of the stuff that came out of this, uh, this study. And uh, it's cool because it supports a lot of what we talk about on the podcast. And it's even cooler because they did some pretty cool comparisons. So check this out. They compared uh, resistance training plus diet to endurance training plus diet to resistance training plus endurance training plus diet. So those were the three groups or the three comparisons. The one that did the best with body composition changes, resistance training plus diet. It even outperformed mm. strength training plus cardio or plus endurance training plus diet. So just strength it training plus diet. reiterates everything you've been trying to write about. Huh? It, it performed the best. It also was the most effective at reducing fasting, fasting insulin levels and and uh the and blood lipids it was actually superior in pretty much every category wow just strength training and diet now okay so let's take this further because i think this is such an important study because it, it does align with what we talk about on the show and we do get a lot of pushback on the the, the message around telling the people no not really to stuff. do cardio at first and to focus on strength yes. training but this is the reason why now how would you explain this to somebody on how in the world did somebody get better fat loss benefits and overall health and strength and everything from just diet and resistance training and not the diet resistance training and cardio routine? So here's so there's a couple things. One is when you're when you're cutting your calories, you are sending a very very loud signal to your body that is saying we need to adapt our metabolism to meet this this lower caloric intake because your body's always trying to achieve balance. It doesn't want to burn more than you take in. This is an evolutionary, this is a part of uh, how our bodies evolved. Well, it's always trying to survive is what it's That's trying right. to do. That's right. So when you're eating less than you're burning, your body's like, okay, we need to learn how to burn less. Now, strength training sends the opposite signal indirectly. Now, strength training, the direct signal is build strength. The indirect part of that signal is, well, through the strength building process, if the body believes it needs the strength, you are going to maintain a faster metabolism and you're going to build more muscle. Right. Or you'll get, uh, not just maintain a met metabolism, but you may, might even speed it up. This makes body composition change more effective, meaning fat, just pure fat loss. Because one of the ways that your body will slow its own metabolism down is by reducing calorically expensive uh, tissue, muscle. Your body will reduce its muscle to reduce its caloric expenditure. <coughs> so if you do strength, if you do so in, in endurance training, thank you. Endurance training burns a lot of calories. Endurance training does not tell the body to keep muscle. So if you're burning even more calories with more endurance training and cutting your calories, now you're really telling the body 
pare muscle down. Yeah. If you do strength training plus endurance training plus cutting calories, you are sending a muscle building signal, but you're still burning a lot of calories and you're still competing a bit with it. So you're going to still see some muscle. It's that competitive signal. Right. Yeah. And I also think this, this is the other part of this, because this was a big study and it wasn't done on like advanced you know, people. This was done on like the average person. I think the average person is also always <clears throat> playing a game of, Am I going to overdo it? Am I going to underdo it? What should I spend the most time 100%. doing? 100%. It's such a fine dance. It's a fine dance. <clears throat> so for the average person, if they're going to spend, what they should do is completely prioritize strength training. If they have extra time, then do the cardio. And in fact, rather than doing that, what do we always advocate for? Just do more walking because it's much more sustainable, yeah. especially when you cut your calories. Well, here we have a study, and this is a new study. This was published in, in December. <clears throat> but, and also better fasting insulin, better triglycerides, better cholesterol. Why? because of the fat loss. When you lose fat and maintain or keep muscle, you're gonna have better fasting insulin because muscle is very insulin sensitive. And fat loss itself, even actually, even if the diet isn't great, so long as it's low calorie, uh, will give you better uh, better blood lipids. So pretty wild. Yeah. yeah, I think the mistake that people make is when they're already low calorie and then they add the, the cardio in addition to it. When if you were going to do cardio, like let's say you, hey, I want just overall health and I don't really care about if I lose a little bit of muscle, although I'm not trying to lose a lot of it. And so I do want to incorporate that. A better strategy would have these would be to undulate your calories, have higher calorie days, yes. and on the higher calorie days, yes. you do the intense cardio. So you get the endurance, the stamina, the health benefits. That's right, and so not the, the muscle loss. That's right. Yeah. And so when you're well fed, which is the opposite of what I think most people think, is most people are trying to lean out, lose body they fat. They think they're stacking fat loss. That's right. Techniques. And so they go like, oh, I'm I've already I'm low calorie today, and I'm going to throttle down on the cardio, so I'm going to burn even more fat. Is what they're thinking, but it, that's not what ends up happening. What ends up happening is you you burn probably about the same amount of fat, but then now the body pairs down muscle because it thinks like, oh shit, we have this expensive tissue. Now this person's not only not feeding me much, they're also asking me to run like crazy. So mm -hmm. I don't need this expensive tissue. Get rid of it. We are mm -hmm. very close to this being standard um, uh, protocol by Western medicine. I think with, we're within five years of them saying, hey, let's prioritize strength training above all other forms of exercise because we know that people are really going to do one. And this one seems to be the most effective with the least amount of time. Because again, it's not about the calories you burn while you do it. It's about the muscle building signal. And you only need to do like, like one or two days a week for the average person right. will send that muscle building signal. You don't need to do yeah, a lot glad of it. Glad they're finally catching on. Oh, I, I mean, I, I like to think that we're, you know, obviously we're not massive and mainstream, but we're starting to make a little bit of a wave, I feel like. I mean, we yeah. just had a live caller in that, wasn't he, was he an obesity nurse? What was he? Oh, uh, uh, he was uh, he a what practitioner. Yes, he worked in, in obesity clinics and he right. was a nurse. Yeah. Right, and he uses MAPS That's anabolic the as, the, as yeah. the primary source to- Speaking of MAPS anabolic, I, we haven't talked about this in a while and, and someone just reminded us, people don't know this, we offer the first week of MAPS anabolic for free. Oh, that's right. We you have a video series on YouTube. You, yeah. you can follow the first week of, this is the most popular MAPS program we have is MAPS Anabolic. It's the one that is most appropriate for, for most people. You can get the whole first week with video demos and everything for free on YouTube, which is going to be linked up here. So if you want to follow it for a week and, and not have to buy anything at all, well, you, you know go. the other thing that so I'm I'm running the Mind Pump Media uh, page today, and so I I see the tags, and so I obviously see different tags when I'm running that than my personal one, and uh, two tags today I saw of people talking about the 30 days of free coaching that we've had. We never talk about That's that. That's another thing. Never anymore. bring it up. Yeah, anymore. And it, I, I mean, I see, so I get the stats every day. So I get to see like how many are inbounding on it. And the thing averages like 30 to 50 intakes a day of new people that are following. Basically so, what you get is every cool. day for 30 days is you get a topic and a coaching, basically coaching every single day Yeah. in your email. It really, I mean, I'd really like to go back and revamp it, but even with it being as old as it is, it's still great information for someone who is especially right now yeah. in the new year you have a lot of family and friends who don't know where to start or just getting started like couch to resistance they've, training yeah they've never yeah. listened to any of our shows you're trying to help them like how yeah. do i what what's like what bits of information would i give them from mind pump well the 30 days of free coaching is is a great resource because they are going to get us a, a short email every day that's going to cover a single topic on there is also links to episodes where we talk about the topic further in detail if they have more questions around it. Extremely valuable. Yeah, yeah. speaking of, of callers, uh, I want to bring up, so we had a caller a while ago, her name was Teresa, oh, yeah, who had called forum. in, She and she had talked to us about you know wanting to diet, whatever. Anyway, our advice to her was to feed herself, eat more, focus on strength training, 
we had asked her questions like, have you had a menstrual cycle? Because it, we, we, I think we all knew that like, she was probably under eating. Well, here she's in the forum. This was January 1st. She wrote this and she said, hey, I'm the live caller at the end of episode 1976. I'd like to share my most recent celebration, the return of my menstrual cycle after 12 years without one. Wow. That is a big deal. And he says, I decided to follow your advice and eat a fucking cheeseburger. <laughs> he said that too. I, I said, go eat a I fucking cheeseburger. That. That's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> I I'm so glad she did well, that because I remember her, right yeah. away who she was because yeah. I totally remember. Dude, 12 that. years? Yeah. 12 years. And now she finally got That's Crazy. a big Crazy, yeah. That is a very, very um, uh, loud and clear signal from for, for women and their bodies. That's awesome. Yeah. Losing your, your, your menstrual cycle. And then maybe that, even that, you know getting that, it back. Well, that's, that's good so to hear. Anyway, awesome. speaking of eating, uh, did you guys see uh, Butcher Box's uh, promo this month? No. no. Okay, so Doug, maybe you could pull up. Oh yeah, check it out. You what get you, you get pork tenderloin, ground turkey, and top sirloin steaks for free uh, with this month when you wow. sign up at Butcher Box. Plus ten dollars off. So I don't know giving how giving away the house. I don't know how they keep doing the, that. Probably one of either. the bigger giveaways. No, that's one of the bigger giveaways. You get all three of those for free. I was happy with just their bacon giveaways. Plus, <laughs> I don't, you know, these holidays helped it. So my, I have a. Uh, I don't know if you guys do. You guys have freezers in your garage? Do you yeah, stock do. up? Yep. <clears throat> yeah. So we stock up in on the freezer, and our freezer has been pretty full for a while. And yeah. I've been telling Katrina, I'm like, you know what? Can we stop shopping and like really start to chip away at the freezer? Yeah, we did so, the same thing. So we actually are like uh, saw the bottom of our freezer for the first time in a long time where we started like, you know, cause I have a lot of miscellaneous meats and I'm like, Oh, what am I going to make that? Or what am I going to put that in? And so I was just like, you know what? Let's discipline ourselves to get through that. And you know, of course Dude, the new butcher box comes in right you away. You know so what I did with the pork? So, you know, I always talk about their pork. I'm not a fan of pork, but they have that heritage pork, which tastes real good. Yeah. So the, 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 the pork is thick, right? Yeah. So I take them and I cut them in half. So I have two thinner slices. I get uh, egg and I dip them in egg and then I do uh, seasoning and then breadcrumbs. Oh, interesting. And then I get a cast iron uh, skillet yeah. and I put just enough olive oil to be able to kind of low, real, real low fry. So it's not like it's in mm. oil, but it's, you know, somewhat. And it's, what do they call that? Schnitzel? Is that German for what it is or whatever? So sure. good. They're so Why good. do I feel like you don't do that? Schnitzel. Jessica does that. I swear to God, I do it. You, you do that? I did it. Bro, first really? of all, we got an infant. You think she can get up and do anything really? right now with the baby attached I can't believe you can do that. I did. I didn't even know you knew how to use a cast iron <laughs> <still. laughs> I make. I can make meat. Yeah. <laughs> I can yeah. make, the meat I, stuff, I can do. Yes. We were, uh, we I were, make meat, dude, vegetables, and rice. We were, making, we were making fun of you as a worthless Italian over the weekend. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had Marcucci with us, right? So, oh, right, right. So, so Marcucci came up. I love that guy, too, by the way. Yeah, he came up, guy. and that was Doug's first week of really hanging out with him, huh? Yeah, yeah. He's quite dude, a character. Isn't he, right? He said, and boy, he loves to cook. Yeah. Yeah, he he he's got good up at it too. first thing in the morning. He'd have five or six pans going, fine, making yeah. everybody like these super custom breakfast burritos. And for his birthday, his request was that he cook dinner for all of us. Like, <laughs> so I was like, man, where's where's this Italian Dang. side of Sal? I said yeah, he never right? cooked shit for use us. that. Yeah, <laughs> dude, I made exactly. this this white wine sauce. I can't remember the ingredients, so this is gonna be kind of a waste of time. But I did make a white wine sauce that I made with uh with gluten free noodles. And my kids, you know, my older kids who they, they also stay with their mom, who's from Italy and cooks. So I was like a little nervous. Like, are they going to like this? Loved it. Uh, wow. Okay. Actually, I actually hit well, it out of the park. I actually did a cooking class when I was in Scotland, which is like outside my comfort zone completely. But also I, kind of a random place to do that. Very at. random. Well, <laughs> they're very, not really known for food, are very they? Very different. You know what? They have really good food. It's just- it, Oh, really? It depends on, yeah. Like like the the authentic stuff. Like I had ha we had haggis balls that I, wow. was, I didn't really care for it. I mean, it's not like they're they're like balls. Those are like yeah, baby like goat balls. Testicles. What are those? No, no, haggis is stomach, right? Haggis stomach, intestinal meat. You know, kind of ground up, but they oh. season it with some specific season. But uh, Courtney likes it and loves it, whatever. But that was like one of the things on the item. Which so what you do is you you he he taught me how to like make this peppercorn sauce <clears throat> that I would actually like finish off with a bourbon, and then you put you would put that on. I'm gonna put it on steak. He put it on the the haggis, haggis balls. balls, and I was like, Ugh. but uh, you know, like I was like, oh, I'm gonna take this and then apply it to to steak when I get home oh, for sure. Delicious. So <laughs> yeah. Oh hey, uh, shout out today. So um, I don't think we've shouted him out. I know we've obviously had him on the show and talked about him, but. Such an excellent follow is our good friend Dr. Stephen Cabral. So his yeah, Stephen S T E P H. Yeah. So uh, his, yeah. it's Stephen Cabral is is the handle, and uh, you know multiple times I've shared some of his posts and his tweets that he does. So um, I love the content that he covers. So just a, a a great follow. If you're not following Stephen Cabral, make sure you guys follow him. Hey, check this out. You got to check out a company called Joy Mode. They do sexual performance booster supplements for men. It's like a pre workout. 
but for sex. Now, this was created because a lot of the products in the market are not so good. They don't work very well. And then, of course, prescriptions come with all kinds of side effects. Joy Mode is all natural, science-backed wellness products specifically for men. Go check this company out. Go to usejoymode.com forward slash mind pump. Enter the code mind pump and get 20% off your first order. All right, here comes the show. First caller is Justin from Maine. Hey, Justin, how's it going? How can we help you? Gentlemen, uh, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. I've been listening to the show for the last four to five years. I'm um, going back to probably the early four to five hundreds as far as uh, the, the shows Ooh. go. So, you know, everyone kind of feels like family at this point. Uh, <laughs> Sal's been through a couple of pregnancies and a book. You know, Adam's <laughs> been through early stages of fatherhood, a couple of a couple of houses, a couple of questionable stocks. Uh, <laughs> Justin, uh, Justin I, I appreciate um, your 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 coaching. I, I've been coaching my kids growing up, and I believe he's actually growing the same beard since episode seven hundred two around. <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty much the same length. It doesn't go any further than this. Uh, split ends. It, it, in, all, in all seriousness, I, I have nothing but praise for for what you've all been contributing and continue to contribute to the space. Um, I'll preface my question by stating I'm not a personal trainer. Uh, I'm a family nurse practitioner. I work in family medicine, but I also specialize in obesity management. Um, I'll apologize to everybody up front by saying Sal was right. Uh, when I pers- when I make recommendations for physical activity, I, I, I first make a recommendation for strength training and resistance training and I actually prescribed MAPS programs to my patients. So I appreciate that being um, awesome, available. Of, uh, available for, for, for people to have. Awesome. So my question is training based. Um, I was asked to help coordinate training for a, a group for which I'm, I'm working. I don't, I don't know if I can like drop names or, or what the preference is with that. Yeah, you can, you can, drop, organ- yeah, you could talk about okay. that. Okay. So I'm working with the summit project and the mission of the summit project is to honor our state's post nine 11 fallen service members and through education, fellowship, and physical activity, provide assurance to their families that these sacrifices will never be forgotten. So there's going to be a group of 10 individuals, including myself, that will be hiking the northernmost um, part of the Appalachian Trail. Uh, beginning in July, we'll be doing 125 miles over probably a 10 day time frame, anywhere between 22, 23,000 feet worth of elevation gain and elevation loss. Um, it's also one of the more remote parts of the Appalachian Trail as well. So we may or may not have a lot of access to, to for replenishing points. Um, we're also, in addition to our packs, we're also going to be carrying um, stones of the fallen. So um, these are chosen by the Gold Star family members with sentimental value. And we will take the weight of the stone and have it also be representative of the burden that is carried by service members and their and their family members as well. So um, I think it's going to be uh, really a really powerful type of event. So seeing how I'm coordinating the training, I wanted to bring in expert consultation. While I understand that nothing will really replace putting on a heavy pack, hiking for days at a time, logging miles multiple days in a row, um, I do also have access to anabolic performance and prime, which I think would be of most benefit when we're looking at what this training regimen will look like. And I presume it's going to be some type of inverse ratio with with strength to endurance that will slowly shift over the next six months. Um, and we do have a, we we got a pretty badass group worth of people. We have veterans, we have marathon runners, we have gold star family members, we have lifters, and all of us are hikers. So I wanted to kind of present it to you and see what your thoughts would be of how we could potentially mold and integrate maps programs so that we we thrive in our endeavor. Yeah, great. This sounds pretty awesome. Yeah. yeah. So you're doing uh, 125 miles over 10 days. So on average, 12 and a half miles a day. I'm assuming some days will be less, some days will be more, correct? Correct. Okay. And this is in six months? So we we start our, our journey on July 1st. Okay. 
So right now you could focus on building a strong base, but the closer you get to the hike, the more your training is going to be simulating the hike itself. Mm -hmm. um, I do recommend that when you do do your hikes, that you use the same equipment that you'll be using on the hike itself, mainly because it helps you discover whether or not your pack is the right size or right placement or your shoes are working properly. The things that when I would train people who would do similar types of events or, 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 you know, training or whatever, the comments I would get would be like, man, I didn't realize that I got a blister in this part right here because of my shoe or my backpack, you know, started to dig into my shoulder over here. And they really didn't discover it until the, until they started doing the event, because when they were training, they didn't use the, sp the same exact type of equipment that actually makes a huge difference. So um, just something I want to comment on. But right now I would say you're building foundational strength, but the closer you get, the more you're doing mobility and the more hiking you're doing. Um, I would focus on ankle, uh, foot, um, hip uh, mobility, and maybe some thoracic mobility as well, but it's going to be ankle, foot, and hip is where I'm going to be focusing the most. A lot of foot, a lot of foot and ankle stuff because that's, yeah. that's what's going to be taking the biggest uh, beating. Um, so the training is going to start I would say now, uh, two days a week strength training, three days a week strength training, build a strong base. Maybe three months from now, you're starting to make the shift where you're reducing the strength training, increasing the hiking, and working on mobility. And then the, as you get closer to the hike, you're not really doing any strength training. It's mobility work and hiking. Well, what, do you what do you think about, I mean, the thing that comes to mind for me is the is MAPS cardio, um, running that up until getting closer to that time. That way they're, they're building a little bit of cardio endurance. They're still building strength along the way, include some of the mobility around there. I also <clears throat> see a place, you know, we, we tease on the show about the elevation mass, but here's an example of where I would actually apply it to my, my training, where I would use this. They're going to climb 20,000 feet on this climb. Mm -hmm. So actually using those masks in their training would actually have some benefit. If you have access to something like that, I would do that. Potentially. Too. Yeah. Potentially. So if you're to stack like our maps programs, like if you want to build the base, like start with anabolic, yeah. move into like performance. One thing with performance, I think that to Sal's point earlier about like foot strength, uh, to, if you can, uh, do, um, like squats barefoot, if you can do, um, uh, farmer carries barefoot, do a lot of walking patterns barefoot, um, just to get that sort of, um, uh, dexterity and, and strength, even through the toes, through the ankles and just get uh, a good grounding kind of base, uh, to that. So, and, and as well with, with, um, performance, you get the mobility sessions in between, which is going to be yeah. huge for reinforcing now, and strength. Now and to add to what Justin's saying, uh, because you're going to be working with equipment, right? So, uh, to give, use another example, a power lifter would work with knee wraps and a belt. It would be a good idea for a power lifter to develop good core stability, good stability in his hips uh, and his ankles and strength in his knees. But the closer he gets to competition, he needs to get used to training. He or she needs to get used to training in a belt and knee wraps. So your workouts, as you get closer to your hike, you should be wearing the same shoes you're going to be hiking in. Yeah. You should be wearing all the, the the equipment you'll be using when you're hiking because it's not going to be so much of how good I can perform without the equipment. It's going to be how good can I perform with the equipment that I'll be using because you're not going to be doing the hike barefoot. Mm -hmm. And so I want to make that point because people can sometimes get a little confused and be like, oh, I'm, I'm really, really good, you know, barefoot, no equipment. And then they go put the equipment on and their body's not acclimated. Right to all of this equipment. And like I said, I've trained a few people who've done things that are similar. And the biggest uh, challenge for them was the equipment, was 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 the stuff that they were wearing, was the shoes that they had on. They didn't realize that it dug into a particular part of their Achilles or their heel or their foot or whatever. So the closer you get, the more I'd wear the same equipment when I'm working out, when I'm doing mobility, and of course, uh, when I'm hiking. Now, diet-wise, uh, I would want to go into this with a higher body fat percentage. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at like, uh, I want to go in with 15%, 16% body fat percentage. I don't want to go into this nine, 10%. That's not a good idea because you're not going to be eating a lot. You'll be expending a lot of energy and you know, 15, 16% body fat will give you some good energy reserves. So don't go into this shredded. You want to go into this, you know, kind of a healthy body fat percentage, like 15, 16. That's not, that's not, that's not overweight. It's also not uh, super lean. So run anabolic, run performance, all of them in a bulk, and then transition into what the final? Because he's got Cardio, he's he got said. basically what six months. Yeah, right? six, six months. Yeah, yeah, I would go. I would go. Right. Uh, cardio. Yeah, maybe cardio, and then maybe just mobility, mobility yeah. and hiking. Like that last 
four weeks is hiking and mobility work and and not much else. I mean, it could look more like OCR at that point, yeah. uh, just for endurance and, and uh, I, I guess that kind of challenge. I mean, with only six months, I like something more like performance, right? Because I don't think there's time frame. There is, yeah, time. I, so right. I, think, I think performance right now and then cardio and then tail, tail off from cardio yeah. to what you're saying. I agree. Okay. And keep and, and the only thing I would keep in there is like the mobility stuff, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So I would run performance as it's laid out. After performance, I would run cardio. But while I'm doing cardio, all the cardio recommendations we have in the program would be centered around the hikes. Yeah. yeah. So it would be it would try to I would try and emulate the the the, the hikes instead of doing what we prescribe in there for yep. cardio sessions. It would all be around around the hiking. Yeah. And then I would just include the mobility stuff from performance in there too. So I'd have some days where we would, you know, add some mobility work. And obviously that would be more, if I was training these people, it'd be more curtailed to each person, yeah, right? So yeah, what do they need know. more of? I'd say, hey, you know, practice this two to three times a day every day because you lack the ankle mobility, but maybe somebody else has yeah, this poor is hip mobility. modifying it completely to the individual. This is right. just given like what, how we'd use like our general maps programs to do this. Those, yeah, now that I think about it too, Justin, another thing I remember coming up was that people were not acclimated or used to the food that they ate while doing these events. So I would also recommend that even though leading up to the event, you want to eat in a calorie surplus, the closer you get to the event, the more your diet should mimic the diet you'll have on the hike. The only difference being more calories. So if, because you're not going to be taking, you know, all kinds of food with you, right? So the kinds of foods that you'll be taking with you probably have a long shelf life. They're dry, things that you can carry very easily. So leading up to that, I would eat very similarly. I would just have more of it, like a lot more calories. Um, and that'll help you in two different ways. One, you'll be able to identify if it works for you. Cause I've had people say, oh my God, I took dried fruit and you know nuts with me and it just messed up my gut. And they would have realized that had they tried doing that beforehand. So that's number one. And then number two, you're eating more of the same. You're just eating the same kind of stuff. Your body's used to it. You feel good. Yeah, if you're probably not going to eat a ton of carbohydrates, those are more uh, challenging to take with you. So you probably have more fats and, and proteins that are essential. Just make the calories higher. And then when you go on the hike, uh, the, the the 10 day hike, it's just less of the same kind of foods that you've been eating for the last maybe a couple of weeks. So just one more, one more thing to consider. Yeah. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? No, no, it's pretty fair. Um, I, I know that like I was excited with some of the performance as far as uh, the work capacity and increasing uh, work endurance, so to speak. But uh, I, I guess I hadn't really considered the uh, the cardio aspect. I mean, living in Maine, I mean, we'll have snow on the ground maybe through June. Um, so so outdoor hiking uh, may be a bit limited uh, leading up to the event. So so we will have to find some some creative ways to, to boost that endurance as much as we can. Well, this is a perfect example. This is where, okay, I... I know on the show we've made fun of people who do the the mask on the stairmaster and stuff like that. But here's an example of where or I would wear like a, a pack where, on a treadmill. Where I would use this, I would yeah. throw the pack on. I would get on a stairmaster. I would use the mask. I mean, if I if, if we have snow on the ground, I can't get outside. I can't do a hike to to try and emulate the closest thing to right. it. And I'm forced to be inside the gym. Then this is mm -hmm. the this is the guy or girl who it makes sense who has the backpack on with the rock in there and has the mask on and is on the stairmaster because yeah. that is the closest thing I think I can get to simulate what you guys are going to be doing without actually going out there and doing. Yeah, it. you know what's interesting too about this is that um, when you when people prepare and you, you talked about the kind of people that are in your group, they sound like people who have experience being fit. Uh, they sound like people who have some athletic uh, you know background. So we're not talking about like just couch potatoes. We're like, hey, I'm going to go hike, uh, you know, the Appalachian Trail. These so fitness is going to be less of a con not not that it's not a concern. It's going to be less of a concern. The stuff that's probably more of a concern are the the unforeseeable things, like I mentioned. Like I said, I I, I had a client in particular very fit, and when he came back from doing something very similar, I'm like, what was the biggest challenge? He goes, man, I didn't realize how uncomfortable. The, some of my equipment was because I'd never really trained for long periods of time in it. And it really messed me up. And he had marks on his shoulders and his feet got messed up. And so, I, so he said to me, if I do this again, that's going to be something that I really take into consideration. And then the, and then the, the food part of it, right? If you radically change your diet, because now you're on this hike and don't realize that it doesn't agree with your system or your body hasn't had time to acclimate, that's going to be a big hurdle. So those are the big things I would say to, to pay attention to as far as fitness is concerned. You know, as long as you don't overtrain, you guys are probably going to be okay. I mean, 12, 12 miles a day um, for somebody who's pretty fit, um, you're probably going to be okay. Um, right. But mobility, 
is going to be a concern. Maintain, not overtraining, that'll be a concern. And then and diet and equipment and how that's used. I, I would say those are the things to focus mm-hmm. on. Okay, cool, cool. Probably a lot of unilateral training as well for stability purposes, you totally. think? Yeah, 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 totally. Justin, do you already have MAPS cardio? I do not have cardio. We'll, no. have, we'll have Doug send that over to you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Right. You got it, man. Thanks All for right, calling Justin. in. Yeah, no, I, th- I really appreciate everything that you guys have been doing. So take care, guys. You Thank got you. it. All right. You know what this reminds me of? Do you guys remember there was a book that came out a while ago that talked about um, how humans evolved to run barefoot? And mm-hmm. there was this like this scientist yeah. who studied born, it. Born to run, I think. I think that's what it was, yeah. yeah. And and he's like, oh my God, when you run, you hit your forefoot first instead of yeah. the back foot. And when you right. put on running shoes, it totally changes the biomechanics. It's natural sort of <laughs> shock that's built in place. Yeah, and here's why we have all these problems with running. And so then I remember we you had all these runners when that first came out who were like, oh my God, this is the answer. And they yeah. went right from running shoes to barefoot shoes or barefoot and had Destroyed all these injuries. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's like, you got to give yourself time to get used to and to acclimate. It's like you could just jump uh, right into it. So it just reminded me of that with this conversation that, you know, you, you got to put this stuff on and use it for long periods of time to really figure out like how, how your body works with it and how to, you know, get the right fit and, and all that stuff. Cause that's part of the training. Yeah. That's why I see like really spending time, like uh, without shoes and like, you know, gradually progressively overloading that, you know, f- to build the base of that. Uh, but to, to the point of like finding the right fit, like once you get to like training and, and being able to find the right shoes specifically, that takes a while. It does. And so if you're, if you're like comfortable and you know what to expect in terms of like, you know, that kind of endurance, uh, within those shoes, uh, you're going to be set up so much better. Yeah. I'm actually surprised that you guys didn't jump all over the elevation mass thing because 20,000 feet is fucking nuts. Do you guys understand like how thin the air is? Yeah. Oh, you guys yeah. know what it's like to train in our, our trucky garage, yeah. which is 5,700 feet? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so think about that yeah. for a second. Now, the only this reason is- why I didn't jump on it is because it restricts breathing and the the data is limited as to whether or not it actually increases red blood cells, which would make the biggest difference. So what it does do, what the data does show is that it may strengthen the diaphragm. So your ability to suck in and blow out. So that's why I'm not all over it. Mm-hmm. Although I don't think it could hurt. And and if I had to bet, I would bet it probably has a positive. Oh, I just, impact. I just think that if there was ever an application for that shit, this yeah. is it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that this is the, this is the person who I'm like, this makes sense. This person strapping this on and getting on that stairmaster is the person who I see goes okay. This this person's about to go from you know basically sea level training to twenty thousand feet, bro. That's a huge yeah, difference. Yeah. Again, you guys know the difference of what it's like when we go up to the Truckee house that's at fifty seven hundred, oh, very thin, and you're yeah. gas yeah. doing 10, 10, 10 squats. Yeah. yeah. So just think about that for a second. Yeah. This person, it makes sense to actually utilize. I'm wondering if it starts. I hope the hike starts at a lower elevation and then works its way up. Sure. 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 Yeah, it's got to yeah, yeah. be right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, it doesn't start at twenty thousand. But it, I mean, even if you got a, a a climb, I mean, they're probably starting at least at five thousand. But or if I'm thinking of the biggest challenge of doing this, right? So twelve and a half miles is not a little, but it's not like a ton, right? So, mm-hmm. but you're doing that for ten days. You're like you said, you're uh, you're at elevation. The terrain is probably uneven, so that's a big challenge. And then think about wearing this pack with the boulders that he was talking about. Mm-hmm. And you know, day one, you're like, "Ooh, that's a little sore right there. Ooh, that hurts a little bit." Day five, you're like, "Oh my god, I got like no skin left on this yeah. part of my foot." No, I think you hit it on the head, especially considering that we're, we're we probably are speaking to people that are relatively fit. Yeah. Right? yeah, if you're relatively fit, you can walk for 12 miles. Yeah, There's yeah. very few people I know that you can't can get through it. That can't hike for 12 miles that are that are relatively fit already. So okay, if we're gonna train this person. The gear is probably one of the biggest things that will be an annoyance. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. The only thing I know he was kind of alluding to, like uh, the unilateral training, uh, interchangeably you could kind of switch out performance with symmetry. I would say, like you know, in our recommendation, but I think performance pretty much covers it. Like, yep. So I agree. Our next caller is Lavar from South Carolina. Lavar, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey, what's going on, fellas? Definitely a pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, been a loyal listener for about three to four years, ever since you guys were interviewed by Joe DeFranco. So, oh, hey, our boy. Right. to be on the show. My guy. Cool deal. All right, so what I'll do is just kind of describe my issue and give a little context of what's going on here. Um, I guess I'll say for about the past six or seven months, I've been dealing with this sharp right hip pain, kind of around my hip flexor area. Um, I've really been focusing on uh, increasing my depth and range of motion in my squats. So I really feel it more on the days where I do any type of squat or lunge variation. 
Um, the thing is, I don't feel it while I'm performing the movement per se, but it's typically about an hour or two. I'm sitting down, I have a desk job. So if I go to stand, then I'll just have this sharp pain, which will stop me in my tracks. I may feel it for about 30 seconds to a minute before I kind of am able to uh, move without limping or get around normal. So um, I guess my uh, question is, uh, do you guys think I'm trying to push too much from a depth standpoint and or should it be more I'm doing from a mobility standpoint? I do use MAPS Prime before I do all my movements. Um, I actually about two years ago went on a, a mobility kit, kind of like Adam did back in the day where I just tried to focus on like my uh, hip mobility, ankle, shoulder mobility and all that good stuff. I'm really trying to work on the load aspect, specifically with my barbell squat. So I'm wondering if that could be the, the main factor of why I'm feeling this pain. Well, I love, yeah. I love this question. Yeah, obviously the depth is an issue, but that's but the, the real issue is why. Right? Why is the depth of the squat? Yeah, there's a disconnect issue? there. You know, it's weird, um, mm -hmm. uh, Lavar. This is often not the case, but I've now encountered a few situations where this was the case, and it was with people who were kind of troubleshooting um, hip pain when they were doing a squat. These are people who are fit. They're doing you know hip mobility movements. They're working on yeah. abduction. They're doing all this other stuff. They can't figure out what's going on. And then what they figured out was what usually isn't the issue with most people, but with these people, it was weak hip weak flexors. Weak hip flexors, yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Which you, you almost never have anybody tell you, strengthen your hip flexor. Uh, right. It's almost always hip flexors are too tight. Stretch it. it. Yeah, it's like too tight on you because you're sitting all the time, but you're probably just weak there. Yeah, you I, I, I would do okay. like, like a, a simple exercise would be lay on your back, both legs out straight. Keep one leg on the ground and then do a single leg uh, in raise. Incorporate hip thrust. Incorporate, well, that would be glutes. Incorporate hip thrust. Yeah, but you know, you'll get hip flexor okay. in there too, though. Yeah. You'll, you'll definitely get that. Load it on the bar like that with emphasizing the squeeze at the top. You'll absolutely get That's, that. Strength. That'll be glute, but I'm talking about the front. Like we're looking at working the yeah. anterior part uh, of the hip. So like a leg, like a single leg leg raise or a knee raise. Knee raise, okay. yeah. Uh, I like the hanging knee raise yeah. too. And, and they have this um, monkey foot. I yeah. yeah. Where, they, where you can yeah, attach. Yeah. Yeah, like a um, uh, dumbbell uh, to your to your ankle, and and you do those leg raises like one at a time while hanging. Yeah, that. So I would try try doing some single leg leg raises or knee raises before you squat. See if you notice a difference. See if it actually helps. I also um, think map symmetry for you. That's the other thing. Like, so I, uh, yeah, yeah uh, unilateral gonna, stuff. Was we're going to send you map symmetry because I would for sure. Honestly, all I would do because awesome. I, I I would be I hate doing the. the the little tedious shit like that, you know? So if you can, you discipline yourself to do it, then fine. I honestly think if he had just added hip thrust, barbell hip thrust in there with map symmetry, I guarantee you're going to see a difference. Well, keep doing, keep doing what you're doing with the mobility stuff. And you add those things. <clears throat> and I bet you, he would see a difference. Well, what are you doing now for your, for your, you said you, you know, in your, in your written question that you're doing hip mobility. And it was, so what are you doing? Are you doing hip thrust and, and what else are you doing? Yeah. So, so I'm actually about to, uh, uh, starting next week going phase three of MAPS performance. So I'm doing all the mobility stuff that's there. And then I use everything from MAPS prime to prime. Yeah. It, I, you know, so again, I'm guessing, but I, I feel pretty confident that it's your hip flexors because I know what hip mobility looks like. I know what the exercises look like in our programs. And rarely mm -hmm. do we put any targeted hip flexor work, mainly mm -hmm. because it's right. usually an issue for people. But somebody who's fit, like you, literally, this there's, you're like the. There's been three people now that I've talked to. I had this similar problem, so that's why you know that's something I did to strengthen it. It really made a big impact. Which I was doing all the mobility for it. I was doing the 90s. <clears throat> I was doing the you know the kneeling hip flexor stretches, thinking it was a, a tightness issue, but it was a strength yeah. issue. Yeah. So so I try it before you do your next workout, and it may okay. sound tedious and small. But you'll know if your hip flexor is weak, you'll try it and be like, oh, wow, that doesn't feel right. That feels kind of strange and not so strong. And get them to activate a little bit and then try your squats and then see if you feel the same the next day. And then with map symmetry, just because it's unilateral, it it naturally will open up and highlight any imbalances or mm -hmm. weaknesses that you may have. I'm assuming this is one hip and not both. Yeah, no, it's it's my right hip. Yeah. yeah. There there also mm -hmm. there also could be a slight asymmetrical shift at the bottom of your squat because it and it only comes out when you load it really heavy. So this is also mm -hmm. a possibility. Yeah. So I would take a video of myself 
from the front side and back. And I would okay. really, really pay attention at the bottom of that squat. If you see the slight shift to one side or the other, and normally there's some sort of a breakdown in the feet first. Mm -hmm. So I, so I had the same issue. Mine wasn't hip flexor. Mine was at one side was my foot was slightly pronating more on one side than the other, which was causing okay. me to shift my hips at the bottom of my deep squat, just a tiny bit. And that little bit of a shift just overworked that one side. And then it just like you, I wouldn't feel it during the workout. I'd feel it mm. like the next day and it felt like someone was sticking a knife in my fucking hip. Yeah. And that's yeah. and it, yeah. it was and it was all related to my foot. It was actually related to my foot and then the shift in my hips at the bottom of the squat. So that also could be it too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that. no, that 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 makes me feel better because it was getting a little frustrating because I feel like I'm doing everything from a mobility standpoint. So the fact that you guys have uh experienced it yourself, you're you're hitting the nail on the head with exactly how I'm feeling. Yeah. So yeah, to Adam's point too, like it, it, any sort of like rotation with that, um, one way to address that is a single leg deadlift. And yes. to do that, um, you really want to pay attention to your foot, whether or not it starts to ro rotate at all on you. And to be able to, the whole intent of that exercise is to make sure that everything stays completely straight. And if it doesn't, <clears> then <throat> you stop and then you keep uh, at it. So that way you can build and, uh, you know, pattern that correctly. This is why I love map symmetry for this right now. I think map symmetry, okay. yeah, because it has all, it's all unilateral work in there. So I think that's going to really benefit you. But I, if it's not one, it's going to be the other, the two things that we're talking about. And, you know, 99% of the time, it's one of those two things the hip flexor thing i think is is way less common uh than but it's I, so frustrating it's yeah. like you'll get somebody who's fit, like justin i remember you doing this like yeah. he couldn't figure it out couldn't and then yeah. I, I don't remember who i talked to it was that trainer that we know i can't remember his name right now real smart guy can deadlift a ton of weight uh good friend of ours i, I can't his name slips right now but uh he told me oh man i had the same thing it was my hip flexor i told justin and Justin was like huh i wonder and you went out and did some stuff for your hip flexor marlin like, right yes there yeah, you go marlin yeah yeah, yeah, yeah marlin right. yeah so, that's it. Cool. So can I follow up with two quick uh, uh, program questions real sure. quick? Yep. So for um, performance, um, considering all the issues that, you know, the remedies for my uh, issues, should I still try to focus on load in movements or should I kind of just bring the weight down, focus on the technique and getting it to be, feel better first? Or you think as long as I do like the uh, the proper priming and the, uh, the moves that you recommend i should be fine and still try to push the load i mean i would lighten the load but i also like the idea of somewhat challenging it every once in a while to see if you're making improvements so like when okay. i'm when i'm troubleshooting something like this i back off the load a little bit i put in the work on the things that we're talking about and then i kind of challenge it again see if see if the problem arises again so you're kind of going back and forth right so you're I would yep. say come back on the load, focus on the things that we're talking about with the feet and the hips and the stability and all those things. You're going to go to symmetry right away. I'd actually, I'd want you to go right into symmetry, okay. start training that and follow it how, how it's laid out. And a lot of that isn't focused on really loading, but it's okay to kind of load every once in a while to see if that you have that breakdown every time you load. Cause that tells you yeah. like, okay, I'm not fixing the problem. It's still there. Hopefully you can start to progress the load and you start to see that it's getting less and less or it goes away completely. Perfect. All right. And you actually just answered my next question because I was following uh, the intent was to follow RGB as laid out. So I was going to ask, when should I work in symmetry? So I'll go into that right after. Yeah, right yeah, right yeah right go right at symmetry. Yep. Awesome. All right. Perfect. Thank you so much. You got it. Big help. All right. You got it, man. Thanks All for right, calling man. in. All right. Awesome. Yep. Thank you. You got it. Yeah. It's a uh, uh, boy. It's, uh, this, this is something that was recent where it was Marlon. It was Marlon. And he's like, mm -hmm. man, I had weak hip flexors. And this is a guy who's fit, strong, pulse over 600 Killing, pounds. Yeah. He's like, I couldn't figure out why the hell my hip felt impinged. And that's because nine out of 10 times, it's not that. Yeah. Nine out of 10 times you have someone do that, it gets worse. So was, I wouldn't uh, even really have thought weird. to go in that direction, which is crazy. Because you, again, like from the mobility side and the background, I saw how that really transformed like the way I could move. And then so I'm like, it has to be a mobility issue. Yeah, you exactly. Know? But no, I just was lacking strength. Wasn't it him who also said that he started to incorporate the hip thrust and then he noticed he didn't have any problems with it? Uh, I don't know if he, that had to do with that. He incorporated for sure. Yeah, uh, I know he. I, I know he I started know he to hip thrust to a lot after that because he wasn't doing any hip thrust, and then he started to hip thrust after that whole issue happened. And then I thought that was enough for him to not have that problem anymore. Yeah, no, he was doing uh, like, well, like especially if you hold at the top, you have isometric component to that. He, you know, you can get some good strength there. Yeah, but the, he was doing. I think it started with like single leg knee raises and like those little things. Yeah. You know, just kind of 
connect. But yeah, it is it is interesting. It's really frustrating when you're doing you feel like you're doing everything. It's not frustrating when you're doing nothing. Yeah. Because then you're like, well, I guess I'm I, I know why I hurt. But when you're doing everything, uh boy, it can you start to have to become Sherlock Holmes trying to figure out the Yeah, whole I really feel like yeah. it's gonna be one or the other are those two things that we yeah, just same. we just said. It's more more likely one of those. Our next caller is Stacy from Oklahoma. Hi Stacy, how can we help you? Hello. I have a question. Uh First of all, I have a tendency to go off on a tangent, so stop me if I already digress <laughs> no down problem. that way. <laughs> okay, that's um, enough there. We can answer it. We, we can do that. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> my my question is, um, I try to keep my protein between right around 130 grams um, and my calories between 1,800 and 2,000 a day. Um, I consistently consume too many protein grams okay plus or minus 200 calories i lift four times a week i do mobility i uh recently in the last two weeks have cut my cardio down to maybe a walk every day um i am not seeing body comp changes like i would anticipate um my weight has been consistent for like the last 18 months uh, and I'm wondering if my protein is the problem. I'm, I'm an older female, uh, so I don't know if at some point protein becomes a huge issue. Overconsumption of protein becomes a huge issue as opposed to it just being wasted. Yeah, a few things. So hmm. uh, if you eat too many calories and your goal is to get leaner, then obviously you're not going to get leaner. And those too many calories can come from protein. They can come from fat or they can come from carbohydrates. If your calories are appropriate, uh, can you have too much protein? Well, I guess if it, if it pushes out essential fatty acids, or if you notice any gastro issues from too much protein, some people might get constipated, um, or notice gastro issues. Here's the, here's the other part. Um, I, I can't tell from looking at you, although it kind of looks like you're pretty lean right now. What's your body weight out? How tall are you? Do you know what your uh, body fat I'm, percentage is at? I'm almost 5'7", and I'm probably at, I'm currently at 144 pounds, and I think my body fat is probably at 24. Um, I had been down at 21. I have gained it. Uh, I had gone on a bulk because I got hurt. <laughs> so I just decided to capitalize on that. And I gained 12 to 13 pounds. Uh, and that increased obviously my body fat percentage. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to try to cut. And now I just can't get off the protein, man. A girl likes to eat. <laughs> well, okay, let me ask, can I ask a little bit about your weight training? Says so you train, you weight train four times a week. Are you following a maps program? What does your training look like? I'm not currently following a maps program. Uh, I do have a personal trainer. Um, and I was completing, shall we just refer to it as functional fitness before, you know, that, uh, with a strength component, um, accessory component, and then the uh, conditioning component. And I have decided that uh, I'm just going to cut out, aside from like maybe one day a week, I'm going to cut out the uh, more traditional Okay, I'm lying. Probably two days a week <laughs> without cutting out the traditional more cardio functionality. I do run once a week, um, but I was doing like, okay, it was CrossFit. I was doing CrossFit. Okay, <laughs> okay. So that's, okay, this is where, this is where I was going with this question. I already that. had, I already had a feeling that you were, your training program probably looked like a circuit based type of training program right. and what you need is a good strength based program like maps Pure strength maps anabolic with your calorie intake your nice high protein and and build muscle and build your metabolism you've probably been doing the same type of a routine mm -hmm. which is this kind of go 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 type of lifting weights and your body's probably pretty adapted to it and so you've stalled your progress and so what you need to do is get out of that and train a more traditional way of lifting, which is like a MAPS anabolic or a five by five. Progressive type of overload with a good adequate amount of rest in between. Uh, you know, your body's going to have like a completely different response to that, which I think it's craving that uh, to be able to allow that, especially if you're in a bulk, that's a perfect time to really focus on, you know, a real solid strength training program. Yeah. I mean, we can either eat less or get your body to learn how to burn more on its own. And that's what we're, well, that's what we're trying to encourage you to do. 
I don't want to eat less. So, and, and within the last two weeks, I have started a new training cycle with my trainer so that uh, all I'm doing is weight training. Um, just traditional resistance training. I don't, I don't like machines just from me, myself. So they're all free weights, barbell, dumbbell, kettlebell. Where are your reps at and what do your rest periods look like? My rest periods are probably not as long as they should be. Mm. Uh, and the reps just depends on what he's got me working at. Um, you know, somewhere probably five to two, 15, maybe um, he, if I'm going to do tempo, like say tempo back squats, it's more like five to seven. But if I'm going to do, uh, he just like, literally just changed it. So sounds I, like you I don't do a mass have program. To. Yeah. Sounds like it's all over the place. Yeah. yeah. I would go, I, keep, I, go I would go five to eight reps, maybe 10. Uh, I'd rest two, two minutes between sets at least and just try to get stronger. We're going to give you MAPS Anabolic. We're going to give you MAPS Anabolic and then just have your trainer take you through it. Yeah. And they, and they can modify it based on their experience with you. Yeah. But I would do long rest periods, focus on getting strong, stop trying to sweat, stop trying to get the burn, stop trying to feel exhausted at the end of the workout. Your goal is to get stronger. And if you're getting stronger, then we're probably affecting your metabolism in the positive. And then you'll see the, the effects from that. And, and, and I had gotten stronger over the last, like, say, six months when I, due to an injury, I had broken my foot. And due to an injury, I was not able to do the traditional uh, cardio. So we went more towards a uh, weightlifting, not so much powerlifting, but weightlifting environment. Um, and then, of course, the minute that I was released from the doctor and uh, added that cardio piece right back in there because... I mean, I, I like what I see as far as your macro breakdown, as far as your grams of protein, your calories, the fact that you're walking every day. I literally would just address your training program. This yeah, is mm -hmm. I, you're somebody who I'd say, listen, we're gonna we're gonna follow MAPS anabolic. I don't want to mess with anything with your your calories. I don't think you're eating too much protein, mm -hmm. and if you're not seeing any body composition changes, it's just because you you got an even exchange. You're burning right. exactly what you're taking in, and like Sal said, we could either one cut your calories, which doesn't sound like you want to do. I wouldn't want you to do that either. I would simply adjust your programming to build muscle and focus on 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 getting stronger, lifting weights, long rest periods, which this is at Maps Anabolic. So I'd have you follow that to a T and trust the process, and then we would re reassess at the end of the program. Okay. We're gonna send that. that. We're gonna send but, that to uh, you, Stacy. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. We're gonna send that to you, Stacy. Awesome. Thank you so much. So, but there's not a, there's not like some magical age where it's like thou shalt not have protein. <laughs> no, 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 no. no actually, you're, you're gonna benefit anymore. from it. No. no, if anything, Stacy, the, the the data now is showing that higher. The, the older you get, the more protein you need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're doing. You're you're fine. You're in fact. I would be ecstatic if my my 53 year old female client was eating too much protein. That's actually one of the biggest challenges I had with my female clients was to get enough protein. So that that's a good thing that you crave that type of food because it provides so much good nutrients for someone who's trying to build muscle and build their metabolism. Yeah. So right. I would literally just address your training program. That's what I would do right here. Awesome. Thank you so much. You got All, right. It. All right, Stacey. All right. Thank you guys. Have a good day. Thank you. Have a good one. She's like, I don't do cardio. Yeah, yeah you do bro. with weights. Yeah, you do cardio. Bro, with I knew it. I knew it. Uh, I, I was I like, don't say, uh, but I'm doing CrossFit. <laughs> yeah. She's scared to How say. How dare it. you? Yeah, you I know, knew it. I knew it. Come clean, you guys. You want to know what's crazy? Come clean. Yeah. Literally, a study just came out uh, that compared strength training plus diet to cardio plus diet to strength training plus cardio plus diet. You guys want to guess which one performed wait, 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 the best? Say that, say that one more yeah. time. Sorry, I was strength training plus diet. Okay, versus uh, cardio plus diet okay. versus strength training plus cardio plus diet. Okay. Which one do you think resulted in the most pure body fat loss? The strength training First and one, diet. Just strength training. Yeah. Actually outperformed strength training plus cardio plus diet. Yeah. So you know, it's as simple as that. That is. You know why? It, because it's such a fine dance when you incorporate totally. that. Totally. It's mm. such a fine dance of am I feeding the body enough to get the benefits from the cardio but not get the, the, also not send a signal to my body You're to building. atrophy. Yeah, and that's it. You, you want to tell the body to keep the muscle or build the muscle while cutting the calories so it burns the body fat. You got to send both signals. Otherwise, you'll end up losing muscle as your body tries to pare its metabolism down. And so her training, that's what she's doing.
Yeah. She's telling her body, she's burning all these calories manually and her body's just adapting and it's like, okay, we're cool at 20 whatever percent body fat. We're not going to get any leaner. And if she does lose weight, what'll end up happening is her body fat will probably stay the same. And it sounds kind of like the, the trainer, it's not, so I, it's hard to say if they're, they're good or bad or what about that, but it, it, it sounds like it's not, they're not consistently doing anything. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like he's he Typical, or she is mixing it yeah, up all yeah. the time. It's like, and so you get this feeling of, oh well, no, I do do some strength training, but it's like, oh, okay, so you did one workout where it was like yep. a five set of squats, and then the next workout you're already going back to your little circle, or in that same workout yeah. Yeah. you did a, a fi five by five, but then all of a sudden you right. do a circuit set right Just after introducing like so many concepts, like yeah, continuously, yeah, right. very common with trainers. Yeah. Our next caller is Sean from Maine. Sean, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey guys, how you doing? What's up? Pretty good, hey, man. man. Awesome. So I don't know how much background you need. I'm 42 years old. Uh, I've been pretty active my whole life. Um, just uh, recently in the last six months, finished MAPS Anabolic. I went through that twice. Um, and right now I'm just kind of doing my own uh, kind of short workouts every day. And what I've noticed is, and even during Anabolic, we, uh, or I, um, would get a couple of weeks into it and I would feel incredibly like worn out. My muscles just uh, fatigued and it was really hard to kind of do anything. And I basically had to take a week to two weeks off to kind of recover. Um, and that's really been bothering me because I want to like keep moving and keep going. I don't feel like I'm doing too much volume. I'm just uh, working out at home with dumbbells and they're, you know, they're not super heavy. I'm just trying to, you know, get stronger and build some muscle mass. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, it is too much volume if that's how you feel. So, so it's all relative, uh, and, and the context is what matters. So if you're feeling that way, even if you did one set once a week and you felt that way, it would be too much for your body. So the question is, why is it too much for your body? Um, first off, were you training with the appropriate intensity? Meaning were you training to failure or were you following the program as it's laid out where we tell people to not, <laughs> to not go to failure? Yeah. So when I was running through, uh, anabolic, I was following it right to the letter. So the first week or so, it took me some getting used to on uh, the appropriate weights for the appropriate volume. Um, so I kind of dialed that in and, um, you know, I, I, yeah. Okay. To answer your question. I, yeah. He, I mean, <laughs> are you reading up there too, where he talks about his, his food and sleep too, would be another issue. I talked about look at your life overall though. stress bucket because, yeah. because maybe the program isn't that intense, but relative to not good sleep and a low carb diet, it may be. So yeah. that I would, I would definitely dive into that. Maybe I see that you have been running a low carb diet. Is that something that you've always done or something you currently started to do? Cause you wanted to lean out. I don't respond well on too low of a carb diet. Like we've, we've shared on the podcast before. Sal loves that. It works extremely well for him. He can work out fasted. I'm miserable if I don't have a certain amount of carbohydrates in me. I just cannot get the motivation to lift. And, I, and so um, it does, you may be more like me in that situation. And so that may be fe why you feel the way it is. It's not so much the program or what you're doing in the program is too much. It's just too much for what you're also doing with your diet and your sleep. Yeah. Yeah. I would look at, I would look at your whole lifestyle, look at all the things that affect your stress, sleep, diet, stress, and see what's going on. And then I would, and then I, have you been to mphormones.com? Have you talked to any of the, the hormone specialists there to get some testing? I, I have not. I mean, I've heard you guys talk about it quite a bit on the podcast, but it's not something I've uh, dug into yet. Yeah. So when, when, if you get to the point where it feels unexplained, you're like, huh, I'm getting good. I feel like I'm getting good sleep. My diet seems pretty good. I seem to be training appropriately. I'm not beating myself up. My body is not feeling like it used to or like it should. That's when I would I would go get the blood work. Get mm -hmm. blood work done and see if hormones are off, if you have nutrient deficiencies that you may need to fill. Um, because that, that can often be, I, I would actually do that no matter what I would do that. Now okay. you're 42, you're at an age and you're, you're at a point in your life where it's, it, it's worth, if you have the, the, the finances to go and get your blood work done, it's absolutely worth it. At least getting that okay. feedback, because I guarantee you'll learn something. Well, yeah, guarantee. then, then you could see what steps you could take naturally to increase, you know, if, if it's a low dip in testosterone or what, whatever the imbalance is, like if you can kind of adjust like sleep, you can, you know, kind of rearrange things stress-wise to see how that affects you and then like take steps from there. Yeah. I mean, I, that was me, Sean. I, I was, uh, you know, very consistent, dial everything in, I thought, you know, and I just couldn't figure out why little by little 
I was declining energy, my ability to, to, to exercise, work out. My, it was just going down, down, down. And then I got blood work and I was like, well, there it is right there. I had my, my hormones were, did not look good at all. And, um, you know, trying to change them naturally didn't work uh, super well, well with me. So I had to get, uh, and work with a doctor and it was game changer for me. Now that doesn't mean that that'll be your case, but at the very least you'll, you'll get a much fuller, uh, clearer picture. And if it is the case, then, then there are remedies for sure. Okay. And yeah, I mean, I've, I've definitely been working a lot on, I, I, I don't eat a lot of carbs, just kind of naturally, uh, Adam, to what you kind of said. Um, it's just, uh, I, I've been uh, cutting weed out of my diet for like 15 plus years, and just felt a, a whole lot better. We eat whole foods at home, you know, we cook all of our own stuff and, and, and make all those dinners and um, felt a ton better with that. I did get some blue light blocking glasses to kind of help with the sleep. Um, so I'm, I'm actively working on a lot of these things. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I'm hoping maybe, maybe it is a, you know, a low, low testosterone or something, you know, like that. I do have a stressful job in life at the moment. So that could be contributing to that as well, I guess. I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to have Doug send you maps 15. And my recommendation is to switch over to maps 15 for a while while you get your blood work done and see what it says. So see what happens when you drop down to something like maps 15. Um, that may be actually perfect for you. I was, you know, mm -hmm. one of the things that we talked off air when we were building that routine, I remember telling the guys like, dude, this is wild. I'm only training 15, 20 minutes a day. And I actually am feeling yeah, better. Feel like supercharged. Yep. From it. Yeah. So let's, let's, let's switch you over to that okay. for right now. And then let's also get your, your, your blood work done and see what that feedback, yep. maybe the switching over to mass okay. 15 right away makes you feel I a lot like better. That, that would I be like awesome. That. And then I do think no matter what you feel, you should get the blood work done. If you're at a point in your life where I think it's worth it to at least look at your panels and see what it is. And by the way, they will assess it all for you. So you get it done. They'll do a consultation with you. They'll tell you what's good, what's not good, ways that you can improve it naturally, ways that you can do it synthetically, all those things. So it's worth cool. going through that process. Okay. All right. All right, Sean. Thanks for calling in. Thanks a lot, guys. I really, really appreciate your time. All right, man. You got it, yep. man. Yeah, especially when you're over 40, I think, uh, as a yeah. man uh, over 40. Because if, if your tests come back and you're like, well, I'm getting kind of, I'm getting good sleep, I'm eating right, whatever. And let's just say, for example, testosterone is so low that if you doubled it, you're still low. This is kind of a similar situation that I was in. Mm -hmm. At that point, you're like, well, I think then the, the option is to, I'm going to. I, I actually way. love the advice that mm -hmm. Katrina's mom gave all her kids. They, she, on their 30th birthday, they all, what she said, just get a baseline. She, yes. She goes, go get your blood work done. So we have, it's, and there was, oh, I feel fine. That's yeah. why I want you to get your blood. You work know what done. feeling fine should yeah. be. Yeah. Go get it done. So we see what it, what it's like. Cause mm -hmm. when you get 40, 50, 60, my age, she would say mm -hmm. it's not, it's going to be different. And you want to know what optimal feels like and what it looks like right. on paper and then you have a so reference you can replicate it yeah. so i absolutely think you should even do it earlier when you just so you have something and then it, the inevitable will happen as you turn 40 and 50 and 60 they will change it will change absolutely because of diet getting older rest all these other variables and you want to know like oh what is what does optimal feel like and then what what levers can i pull to get myself back to there totally Look, if you like Mind Pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 